Hi, and welcome to one of the most essential courses every programmer should take, whether it's to improve your development skills, become a better programmer, or even increasing your chances of getting your dream job. My name is Vlad and I'm talking about none other than my version control systems course. So, if you've been using Python, C Sharp, C++, or maybe you're a web developer who's using JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, doesn't really matter. What I can tell you is this one thing. This course is definitely for you. Even if you're a student, the skills you're going to learn in this course may help you so much. And since some of the VCS we are going to cover up in this course, such as Git, GitHub, SVN, and maybe even GitLab, since they are so famous and so many high-tech companies use them, taking this course may also help you to increase your chances in your future interviews for getting the job of your dreams. And that's something I can personally confirm since I've been working as an engineer at a large corporation like Mobileye, an Intel company, as well as a couple of startups in the cyber and IoT fields. And let me tell you guys a little secret. In each and every one of them, we used some sort of version control system. And now let's talk about the course. Since I know that you simply want to get to business right away, I've created this course with the most essential content you will need to feel confident and get yourself started as fast as possible. You will get all the necessary explanations straight to the point without any relevant content exactly what you need. You'll be joining over 60,000 students who already enrolled in the course, so don't worry you're going to be in good hands. So, without further ado, enroll in the course and I'll see you inside. Enjoy! Hi, my name is Vlad and welcome to Alpha Tech Academy. Before we start, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you that you're here and thank you for taking action and taking your first steps to achieving your dreams and becoming a better programmer or at least to pass the exam if you're here because of that you've made a great decision and i appreciate it i'm more than excited to share with you my special edition of my course here on this platform i've done my best to make it as clear and practical as possible so i'm gonna let you now start the course and i really hope you will enjoy and that the things that you will learn here will bring you all the results you need and all the results you wanted. So let's go. So who am I and why exactly I'm the instructor you should learn from? You, well, you see, it's very simple. It's just because I've been there. I've been exactly where you are. I've studied two of the most difficult professions, computer science and electronic engineering. And during this period, I've studied and completed successfully over 100 different courses. Also, I've gained practical experience while working as an engineer at a large corporation like Mobileye, an Intel company, as well as a couple of startups which included the development of IoT systems and cyber and security systems which used to analyze network traffic to identify malicious activity on the network. In addition, I've been making some cool projects with different companies like the Japanese Wacom, for example, and I of, I've always been eager and passionate about sharing my knowledge in the best way I can. So that's exactly why I've been working for almost two years now as a lecturer and a practitioner of a variety of courses at computer science and electronic engineering faculties. I've been teaching courses like C, C++, Python, data structures, algorithms, IoT, and a few more. And after receiving feedback from hundreds of students, I really feel like I can share my knowledge with you here on the best side. So I hope you're ready for the course and for the beginning of our journey together. Good luck, guys. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. And in this video, what we are going to do is to talk about the curriculum of this course. So what are we going to learn in this course? 
In this course, basically what we are going to do is to improve our programming skills and learn some new developer essential. We will start by understanding where things usually may go wrong and I will show you two real life scenarios that developers come across during the development process. We are going to talk about what is a version control system and how can it help you to become a professional developer and work on your own projects as well as collaborating with others. We will choose Git as our version control system for this course, okay? This will be our local uh, version control system and we will see how we can download and install it locally and how can we properly make some initial basic configurations and talk in more details about what it is and how and when we can and basically should use Git. All right, so there is a lot of things to cover up in this course. We will then create our first Git project by initializing a new repository, as well as talking about some of the most common Git commands that will let you get started even with your own project right from the beginning, pretty much right from the beginning of this course, which is pretty amazing if you come to think about it, since you will get some real and practical knowledge right from the start. And once we are done with the basics of Git, we are going to see why we should consider using a remote version control system. And if we already talk about remote version control systems, what we are also going to do is basically we are going to take a look and explore more than just one version control system. We are going to talk about GitHub, GitLab, and yes, even SVN, which stands for subversion. We will create an account on each of them, learn how to work with them, how they can be connected to our local environment and how they can be used to work with other people and other projects, basically a lot of additional things, all right? So for example, regarding GitHub, we are also going to see some of the basic GitHub functionalities, how to watch projects, how to view the history of projects, how can we specify different types of issues in our project that we are going uh, to work on and these issues will be basically visible to whoever should take care of them okay so if we are working with a team on some project so we can assign different issues to each of the members and specify what should be fixed what should be developed what should be i don't know uh tested and so on so Whew, let us move forward. Uh, basically, we are even going to see how we can work with branches and basically what they are and how they can be used uh, during different phases of our development process. We are going to see how different branches can be merged just into one branch, okay? So you'll be developing different things and different stuff on different branches. And then once you decide to merge back into one branch, we will also talk about it and we will discuss um, a couple of different merge techniques, okay? We are also going to talk about what should be done if you will get some merge conflict. And basically, we will talk about what is a conflict resolution. So there is a lot of useful information for us to cover up in this amazing course. And once you're finished, you will be able to start working with version control systems in general, okay? And with Git, GitHub, GitLab, and yes, even SVN in particularly, totally on your own, okay? So you'll be able to do that by working on your own projects as well as working on projects with other people and other teammates, as well as you will also be able to contribute your ideas and your developments to different open source projects that you may find interesting. So that's pretty amazing, right guys? 
And before we move on, lastly, one thing that I want to mention is the fact that a lot of high-tech companies require the knowledge of version control flow. And basically, a lot of them use Git, GitHub and GitLab. To be honest, I think that almost in every company that I've been working at, um, most of the departments were using Git, okay? even if these were development departments, integration, automation, and yeah, even quality assurance. So that's also another important reason as to why you should make your best to succeed in this course. So with that being said, I hope you are ready for your fascinating journey. And I hope also that Git and GitHub and GitLab and other version control systems are ready for us because here we go. Good luck. How to approach this course. First of all, what I want you to do is to take a deep breath and smile. Now it's necessary for you to feel some sort of commitment because you are already here and I'm sure you're here for a reason. So I want to set your mindset that it doesn't matter what it takes, you are going to complete this course. From the start till the end, you are going to do it. You are going to be concentrated, you are going to write relevant notes while I teach the material, you are going to write these little ni nice notes that are going to help you to complete this course. You are going to practice and you are going to try to solve each and every exercise and every challenge you are going to face. And by doing so, you are going to become a better specialist and a great programmer. Second, this course is being taught in some sort of sequential manner. And I want to let you know, guys, that every new section that you are going to learn is mostly based upon previous ones, which means you have to get all the challenges done during every section. OK, so during every section, we are going to have multiple challenges. And also, once in a while, make a quick refreshment of the material you've learned so far in previous sections, okay? So this way, it will be much easier and much more effective uh, for you to proceed and succeed in this course. And that's in an important note because you actually are not allowed to jump from one section to another or miss any one of the sections because if you do so, you're probably not going to understand anything uh, at the next section. I mean, anything at all, guys, because everything is based and built one upon another. And if you will skip any section or any lesson, this will be just a waste of time for you, for, for you to take this course. So don't jump back and forth and don't skip any lessons. And the third thing that uh, I think it's very important uh, to understand is how should we face problems and what should we do if we have questions. So during the course, you may encounter with different questions regarding the material that is being taught. Many times, especially at our first sections, we cannot see the whole picture of the course and to understand everything to the fullest, right? And because of that, questions may definitely arise. So uh, while that's good, it means you're concentrated, okay? Because if you have questions, that's my opinion and that's how I see uh, all of my students during their courses. If they have questions, it means they are concentrated in the material and they are listening and they are having doubts and thoughts and so on. And if they don't have any questions, so that's kind of a problem because either they, I am a good instructor and they don't have any questions at all, which I, <laughs> I hope, I hope so, but I'm not sure uh, about it for a hundred percent that nobody will have any questions, or the students that don't have any questions at all, they don't take the material mm, so serious because uh, it's probably good chance that we, they will have some sort of a question, at least one of them. So having questions is definitely okay. 
and just approach them with an ease. It's just a matter of attitude, okay? So if you don't understand something, you have a question, don't panic. So if you got any questions, uh, some annoying bugs, or you're struggling to solve something, that's okay. It's part of your learning process. And what I recommend you to do is the following. Try to see if a similar question has been answered in the FAQ. Maybe someone has asked it before and got a good explanation for that. So it may happen, right? Because you're probably not the first one to tackle this problem. And if so, it's great and it may save you a lot of time. And if not, if you don't see this question, your question in the FAQ section, you may also publish your question and I will do my best to help you as soon as possible. But if your question is urgent, okay, and you want to find an answer on your own, please refer to Dr. Google. That's the best place for you to look for, for an answer. And if, uh, meaning, if your question is not on FAQ of, of our course, then probably you are going to find it on one of the forums that Google is going to suggest you. And I'm not telling you to refer to Google because uh, I will have less work, okay? But I'm doing this because I care for you and I think that uh, by doing so, so you will also practice a very important approach in programming and this approach says that we will not always have an answer for all of our questions and we will not find it right here and sometimes a lot of times during your programming career you will need to refer to google or to any other search engine and to search for your question to try finding out the solution so that's a great practice for you guys so basically this is it for this video i hope the approaches for the course are clear to you and i hope you are ready for our journey together good luck hi there guys and in this video we are going to talk about version control systems in general as well as about using git locally and using github or even gitlab remotely but before you will start your hands-on practice using these nice tools, I want you, first of all, to understand why you even need them in the first place, okay? So, uh, that's why I'm going to show you a couple of real-life scenarios, which some of them you're probably already familiar with, okay? And this way, we are going to build our way up and understand why we should use a version control system in the first place, what it is, what is Git, and also what is GitHub. And since in this course everything is related to one another, make sure you don't miss any, any second of any video. Alright, so I hope you're ready, let's get started and let us talk about a situation that actually happens a lot to us the programmers. So, scenario number one. Suppose that you've been working on some really cool project, maybe it's a website, an application, or even some system. I don't know, but I bet that's, uh, that it, it's actually pretty amazing. Now, you've been working on your project and you've come to some point where your project is up and running and everything seems to be working exactly as you would have expected. So everything is great, but then comes a great idea to your mind. You say like, all right, so I have this great idea and you've been thinking to yourself as, why shouldn't you add this freaking amazing feature that you've thought about last night, okay? So that this feature can make your project even more amazing and take this project to a whole new level. You know, like this genius idea, I got it, oh, I'm going to improve my project, so on, okay? So still, your project is up and running, but you're thinking to yourself, uh, okay, I will improve it. I mean, we all have 
uh, these thoughts sometimes, right? So you decide to take your project and to add this new feature, feature number one, for example, let's call it, or even to modify just one thing in your project. So this way it should work better, or at least you hope so. But unfortunately, once you are done with these changes, your program simply breaks. Your changes broke the program and the project, and now it doesn't seem to work at all. Sounds familiar, right? I guess it is. So in this case, what you do is that you go back, you at least you try to go back to your previous code that was up and running, and you simply try to remove the, the lines you've added and the modifications you've made and take it basically to the previous state that uh, your program had, okay? To make it look exactly as it was before when it was still working. But for some reason, the program still keeps on crashing. Maybe that's because you've missed one line when you were uh, like trying to fix things and to get things to be back as they were previously, or maybe you've deleted one more line than you should. I don't know. But the fact uh, is, is there and the fact is that the program that previously was up and running now only crashes. And surprisingly or not, guys, this situation happens a lot. Whether you're a student or just some inexperienced developer, doesn't really matter, okay? And to be honest, this situation can be so frustrating. Trust me, I've been there and it was not fun. And I absolutely don't want you guys to make these kind of mistakes and this kind of process. All right? So, <clears throat> so, 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 um... So basically, if you ever find yourself in such a place and you want to solve it, you want to do it right, then let th let's think about a situation or better say, let's think about some solution where you have some option to save the state of your program once it was still working, to take some snapshot of all your project at a given time point in time and basically to save it okay just like you can see this version one on the screen so um, this way whenever you would like okay in the future uh, whenever you would like you will be able simply to come back to this particular state okay to this particular snapshot and simply work with that okay so Basically, you're, you've been working on your project and you have like, you have like, I don't know, 10 files, one, two, three, four, five, each one of them has some contents. And we will go like, take a snapshot of all the project as it is. And let's say it will be called like version number one, okay? And then you keep on developing and you reached some new modifications, some features and so on. And you say, okay, so this will be another snapshot that I want to take of my project. This will be like version two snapshot of all the files, all their content and so on. And then you go, there you go, you have like two versions and so on and so forth. And that's how you keep your developing process, okay? So this will be, uh, th this may be really cool if you could just, you know, like at any point in time, go back to version number one, version number two, three and so on, okay? And just proceed working just where we left off, okay, before any changes from version one to version two were applied or from version two to version three, okay? So maybe that's something we need to think about and maybe that's what we are going to solve and to work on and to learn in this course. Awesome. Let me also know uh, if this situation has ever happened to you, if you've ever experienced such a problem or at least a similar one so um, that's basically uh that's basically it regarding the first scenario okay that i wanted to show you i hope that's clear to you as it's uh, our first reason as to why we should consider using some system for example some version control system which this course is mainly all about it awesome so now we are going 
to move further and to talk about scenario number two. And in this scenario, we are going to refer a situation where you have a team, okay, you have a team, a couple of people, like you can see these nice little hands on the screen, and you guys have been working on one and the same project. Everybody does his best by trying to work on all the folders and all the files by, you know, like giving its best and to work and to do as much work as one can, okay? And all of that is just to contribute as much as possible for the development of a project. That's what we do when we work with a team. I mean, makes sense, right? And now let's say that the files you've been working on uh, are also being shared online so that this way everyone can work on these files directly, okay? So the files are going to be like online, okay? And basically everybody can grab a file, work on it, and everybody else can see the modifications and so on and so forth. So everything seems to be nice, okay? But then one night, just before releasing your amazing product, you and your colleague, okay, let's take just one colleague, let's call him, I don't know, Nick, you both decide to make last minute changes to one and the same file. So, to summarize, let's summarize this briefly. Due to these uh, two scenarios that I've just shown you and a couple of additional problems that may arise if not developing appropriately, that's exactly why you should be familiar with version control systems and to be well aware, aware of how to use Git and GitHub and also other remote version control systems in particular. All right, so I hope everything is clear, guys. And just before um, we move on, I would like to clarify a couple of things, okay? For your benefit and to give you as much knowledge as possible, in a, as, at least of this course, I extended the material to support not only Git and GitHub, but rather we are going to talk about additional version control systems such as GitLab and SVN. We are going to see that they mostly share some similar characteristics and the way to use them is also kind of similar. This will give you a better feeling and understanding of version control systems and just to make you feel more confident, of course, Git and GitHub will be discussed in much more depth and we will dive into a broader explanation using especially them, but we will also talk at least a little bit about other version con control systems as well. So don't worry about that. And with that being said, we've reached the end of this video. Thank you guys for watching. I hope that you like the video so far and I hope you're doing great. Until next time, my name is Vlad, this is AlphaTech and I'll see you in the next videos. So what is a VCS? A VCS basically stands for Version Control System and it consists of some of the following characteristics. First of all, it keeps versions of every file in your project, including both new and old versions. It documents every change done to the project by making an associated descriptive message. So every time you will make a change, you should specify why you've done this change so that later on, if we have some bugs or something that doesn't seem to work, we can come back to our, one of our previous versions uh, that uh, were working before this given change was made. Also, a version control system, as its name suggests, is working with versions. So another nice thing that it does is displaying the differences between different versions so that this way you can clearly see what was changed uh, between every version in your project. So simply saying it's great for developing on your own and also to work on different projects with other people. It simplifies the work with your colleagues as well as giving you some time machine with snapshots 
of your project to go back to previous versions in case that something stops working. And there are also other things that we may say about version control systems, but I think that we've already said pretty much exactly what we need for this course. Alright, so basically there are a lot of different version control systems that we can use, but we are not going to make a comparison between all of them, that's not the goal of this course. The goal of this course is basically to take just one of them, one of the most famous ones, uh, one of the most famous version control system where, uh, that is called Git. So that's basically our new and our good friend for this course and it's called Git, Git version control system. And simply saying uh, it lets you keep track of changes in files, it also documents the changes you make as well as specifying who did the change when the changes were done and so on. And after we will learn a little bit about the basics of Git, we are going to proceed with the remote version control system and particularly with GitHub, which is simply a tool that allows you to coordinate work between your members on your team, which is pretty amazing. So now that we know this much, we are ready to start working with Git. I'll see you in the next video. Welcome back ladies and gentlemen and in this video we are going to see how we can download and install Git. So first of all just go to google.com, go to Google and type what do you want to do. So basically what you want is to download Git. So let's go with Git, download and press enter. And now you will see here a bunch of results and we are going to go with this one with git scm.com downloads. So click on it and now you can see that there is a couple of optional downloads that we can use and one of them is used for Mac OS, Windows and Linux. So basically select what operating system you're using, whether it's Windows, Linux or Mac. I'm going to go with Windows, but the download and installation steps for both Linux and Mac are pretty much the same. So click on your operating system and now your download is starting and you can see that it's being downloaded. Um, basically I've downloaded it before, so that's why I can see that there is another version. So just wait until your download is complete and then we will talk again. And meanwhile, while we are still downloading the file, I just want you to know this, that based on your uh, computer, you can choose the 32-bit version or the 64-bit version. So just make sure you download exactly what you, what you will use on your platform. So once you're done, just click on the git executable file to open it up. And now we are going to see a couple of steps for the installation. So basically, uh, here you can see the license, la 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 wow, wow, wow. Okay, end of terms and conditions, basically press next. Here you can take a look at different uh, options that we can use and since it's a crash course, we are just going to go with the default settings. We are not going to cover up everything and explain what is every uh, option that you can see here. Maybe I'll do this much in future courses where we are going to take Git or GitHub, you know, to the fullest and I will discuss uh, all the details about each of them in just not a just not, not not just a crash course but rather some B course that will take you from like they will have to say from zero to a master hero. But that's not in this course. In this course we are going to go with the basics with the default. So press next, make sure that you have enough disk space, press next, then here you can use Vim as Git's uh, default editor. So that's also okay, we can use, you use Vim or use Notepad or whatever you you prefer, maybe Ada, Atom. Um, okay, so I'm going to stick with Vim, press next, Git uh, from command line and also from third party software, press next and use OpenSSL, next, next, next and next and lastly we are going to press next and install. I'm not going to install it, basically let's do it together, okay, and we'll install it once more. So now it's being installed on your computer and once it's done, we are going to proceed with our download and install tutorial. So 
here we go extracting files doing all these things la 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 la, la. Uh, so basically it takes some time but i guess in five seconds it will be over so five four three two come on don't disappoint me one and and we are almost there and let's give it another two three seconds so one two three i guess your computer is much better than mine that you are already over with that so you got a chance to take a break from this uh installation process all right so installing please wait while it's over and now here we are going to uncheck the view release notes we don't care about it we are going to launch git bash so check launch git bash press next and here we go that's our body for uh, at least half of this course so now once this command line is open we are going to increase this window and to open it to the fullest and here we are going to write our commands this is our home directory here is our prompt here we are going to use different commands and first of all let's make sure that we are using git and git is installed so basically type git here okay or in any uh, command line or CMD that you're using on Windows. And if Git is configured correctly, we are going to see here some message, some options that uh, some functionalities that can be used for Git. But if Git was not installed correctly or it's missing some configurations on your computer, you're going to get some message, something like this. Uh, Git is not recognized, recognized. Uh, as an internal or external la 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 okay so if you get this message uh, please make sure to configure git correctly and you may also ask how it can be done if something happens not to work so first thing that we are going to do now is to check our git version and the way to do so is very simple just type down git dash dash version and press enter and you can see that it's actually uh, the Git version that we've downloaded 2.27 on Windows and we are basically okay. So in this course, we are going to talk about a lot of different Git commands and different usages. And basically we will not be able to cover up all of these things that you can see here. And there are also additional things that are not displayed on the screen. So there are a lot of commands and a lot of usages that can be done using Git. And that's okay if you come to some point in the future that you want to do some operation, but you do not know how uh, you should do it with Git or what the, the command uh, should be used for this uh, task. And that's okay, don't worry about it because Git is here to help you. Simply type down something like git help okay because you need some help from git and what it is going to give you is simply a git help menu with lots of commands and additional information that you can get and if there is something specific that you want to know for example what is let's say uh let's say what is git add git add command simply write down git help git help and the command name itself so for example git help add you can see this add here so git help add and you will see what you will see nothing happens oh it tries to open up the information on google chrome so make sure your uh, Google Chrome is configured uh, correctly. And if I press OK, I'm not going to open up, uh, open this here. If you press OK, it will open up a web page with all the information necessary for this command, for this add command or any of the commands that you can use with Git. And aside to just the formal explanation of how it can be used, you, you will also see plenty of examples and usages people came across using the command you're looking for. So basically we've come to the end of this video. I hope you managed to download and install successfully uh, Git and that you also know how to ask for help from Git. And if you want a particular command, we didn't talk about any of them yet. We are going to do, the, uh, to do it in the next videos. But if you want in any point in time uh, in the future to get some more descriptive information, to see some examples that people were using, simply use git help 
and here specify the command that you want to know. And it will open up your Chrome browser and it will show you on a web page all the necessary information. So this is it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next one. So now that we know Git is installed and we maybe want to clear out uh, everything from this window to make it clean, so just press the clear command. So hit enter and you will see that your screen is clear. And now what I want you to do is to configure some of the Git properties. So if you type down git config, git config dash dash list, this will pretty much show you all of your Git settings. And as you can see, there are many settings here. And what mainly interests us is the user name and the user email. Here I configure it to be your email. Okay, here you will specify your email and here you will specify your name. And basically, why is it important to specify these types of properties? You see, when you're developing some application, building some website or developing some cool system, you're probably not always going to do it on your own. Chances are that you will have a team with a couple of developers, let's say designers and so on. So basically you have your project and you have your team and each one of the members on your team is probably going to make some changes to the project, right? And I mean, wouldn't it be nice if you could know who exactly did any of the changes so that if you have some question, you will know right away whom you should contact. I mean, it can save you a lot of time, right? And to do so, one of the ways to configure the username and the user email is just by writing the following commands. So we are first of all going to configure the username, okay? So the username is going to be configured like this. So git config, git config dash dash global, dash dash dash, dash global, user dot name, which is our property. And here we are going to specify your name. You are going to specify your name. I'm going to specify my name. I'm just going to specify, let's say alpha tech. Let's say that's my name for this course, okay? And now we are just going to hit the enter button and we basically configure the username. Let's just do the same for the email. So git config dash dash global user dot not dot name, but rather dot email. And here you will specify your email. Your email is going to be here. So whatever your email is, strudel dot whatever comes afterwards. Okay. So I'm going to leave it uh, like this. Your email is here. Um, let's say it's the alpha tech, alpha tech email will be here. And basically, uh, Git now is configured with your name and your email. So now every change that you're going to make in your Git projects should be documented with your details. So just to make sure that everything was configured correctly, let's use once again the command git git config dash dash list. And there you go. Everything is set up as expected. The username is here. The username is alpha tech. The email is alpha tech email. And basically, uh, the other configuration will live as is for now. And this is it for this video, guys. I hope you managed to configure it correctly and that you are ready to move on to our next video. So finally, the moment has come. We downloaded, installed and configured everything necessary to get ourselves started. And now what we are going to do in this video is to create our first Git project. So I hope you're excited as much as I am. And the first thing that we are going to do is to create some new folder. So let's create some new folder and I'm going to name it something like, let's say first Git project. Okay, that's going to be our new folder. And this folder basically is intended to hold all the files, all subdirectories and everything else related to our project that is going to be also here. Okay. And since we know that we are using Git to help us with all the version control thing and keeping track of files and changes in files, what we want to do is to let Git manage this folder, this directory to let Git manage our project. But how should Git even know what project should it be managing? 
Well, that's exactly what we are going to do right now. We are going to let Git know that we have a project in this given first Git project directory and that from now on Git should manage it. So for that we are going to open up our Git bash command line and here it is. And now what we are going to do is to navigate to our directory, to our first Git project. So if we take a look at this first Git, first Git project, uh, we want to take its full path. So we can see that it's under users, Vladdy, uh, desktop, first Git project. So what we are going to do is first of all to modify it instead of backslashes, to use forward slashes. So just manually modify it and now select it all, press copy and we are going to copy it. And now we are going to go back to our git bash and we are going to use the cd command. And cd basically stands for change directory. And this command simply changes the directory that git bash is looking at at this moment. So change directory to our full path that we've just copied, so paste and see users Vladi desktop first git project and now hit enter and you can see that now now we are looking using this git bash console application we are looking at desktop first git project all that remains to do now is to turn this project this directory into a git project so for that we are going to use the command the special command called git init meaning git initialize. And this way we will initialize a git project, a new repository in this given folder. So press enter and you can see that initialized empty git repository in this uh, directory. You can see that a new directory called .git, it's a subdirectory in our first git project was created. And simply saying this git uh, subdirectory, you can see it right here if your folders are not hidden, you can see that it exists and inside of this directory there are going to be all of the revisions and everything that Git uh, uses to manage and to keep track of files in our directory, in our first Git project. Here we will have a lot of different files, a lot of directories that we will use for our development process. And inside of this subdirectory here, all the magic, basically all the Git magic, all the version control tracking system will happen. Um, since it's a crash course, we are not going to be able to dive into how everything works behind the scene because, I mean, we can just make a full 10 hours course just on this topic, how everything is uh, happening behind the scenes and inside of this subdirectory. And just a side note, guys, don't ever mess with this folder unless you're qualified for that. It can make you a huge mess if you do it improperly. For example, if you remove this folder, if you remove it, let's say, well, where is the remove? If you delete it, then it means you removed all your repository and deleted all of your project's history. And that's not something that you want to do. So now let's go back to our git bash and I will tell you the last note for this video. If you are located in any directory under this first git project, okay, you know that uh, git manages everything that happens inside of this directory and inside of any of its subdirectories and you want to know that it's a git project, that we are inside of some git project, that what you can do is simply to check the git status in this directory. So for example, we can use git status, which is a command of git, that will tell you if that's already a git project or not. If it's not a git project, then you are going to receive a message like fatal, not a git repository, something like this, fatal, not a git repository, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so this message you will get if uh, inside of this directory there is no git project. But here you can see that when you use the git status, git status, you can see that you are on branch master, you have no commits, nothing to commit, meaning you got no error and that means that you initialized your git repository inside of this folder correctly. So I hope that's clear and in the next videos we are going to see plenty of different examples so that you will understand 
what this keeping track really means and how this whole version control works. So no worries guys, uh, if you didn't understand something and if you do not see the full picture yet, we are doing great so far and we keep moving forward. I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye. Welcome back guys to another video in our awesome Git and GitHub crash course. And in this video what we are going to do is that we are going to take a look at a couple of examples and talk about the basic workflow of Git. So simply saying it consists of three different stages. Let's try to explain what it means. So first of all, whenever we create a new file, it's going to be on our computer, right? For example, if we have this directory desktop first git project. So if we create a file in this directory, it's going to be on our computer, right? And one way to create this file would be to use the touch command. So simply type down touch and then type uh, the, the file name. So for example, I'm going to use hello world dot py file and hit enter and this command simply created some empty file that is called hello world dot py simple as that and this file is located under this directory we can use ls command to see all the files inside a given directory so ls and you can see that this file was created under this directory and now since we know this file is kind of empty what we want to do is to edit this file. And one way to edit this file, I think it will be the most elegant and the, one of the most best ways uh, that most of you should be familiar with is to go to this directory and you can see here the file, the hello world.py file. So simply click on it and open it with notepad uh, or maybe you have some other text editor, it doesn't really matter, just use whatever you like. You can use Vim, you can use whatever you use on Mac, and uh, you can use uh, everything that you want. So simply let's use edit with Notepad++, so open it up, and you can see that this file, this file is kind of empty and what we are going to do now is to fill it with some basic program that simply should print hello world message to the screen. And of course, you may use any programming language for that, but to keep it simple, we will use Python for this task. So let's just add this print command. So print hello world, okay? And there you go. You've written your first hello world program, okay? So press save. And for those of you guys who are not familiar with Python, and that's okay, don't worry about it, I will guide you with everything you need to know whenever we are going to use any Python code in our examples. I mean, this course is mainly on Git and GitHub and not on some specific programming language. And what I want you to know is that once you finish this course, it will not really matter what programming language you're using, whether it's Python, JavaScript, C++, C Sharp, Java, or any other programming language. The concepts that you learn in this course may be applied to all of them. That's just freaking awesome, right? So basically, uh, this line of code is very simple. All it does is simply to print out the text in the quotation marks, okay, this hello world to the screen. All right, so we save the file and we can see that it was created in our working directory, in our working copy, right? We can see it's, it was created in this directory and, and it's called the working directory. We will use this terminology later on, so it's important that you will uh, remember uh, remember this one from here. And the first question to be asked at this point, will this file, will this hello world.py file, will this file be tracked by Git? And the answer is no. Whenever you create a new file, just like we've created hello world.py, that does not necessarily mean that Git will track it. So this file for now is considered to be 
untracked. So now if we go back to the git bash and write something like this, git status, you will be you will see that you have here, okay, no no commits on branch master, we will talk about it later on, but you will also see that inside of this directory you will you have untracked files and one of these files is hello world.py. So this file is not being tracked by git yet and if we wanted to make this file trackable and to document all of its changes during our whole future development process then what we have to do is to explicitly tell git to do so explicitly tell git to track it so for that we need to understand that git workflow mainly consists of three areas it consists of the working directory, which is where our file was just created. There is also some staging area, and we also have a repository. So basically three areas that you should keep in mind when working with Git. So what we want to do now is to stage or to add our hello world.py file from the working directory to the staging area. And you can see that we can use git add and the file itself to include in what will be committed. And we will explain it later on. So first, uh, first thing that we have to do is to add this file to the staging area. For now, just think of this area as some intermediary place where you just add new or modified files. All right, we will talk more about it later on in this course. So if we have our hello world.py file, which is a new file, right, then we can use the following command git add hello world, hello world.py, okay, and we are simply uh, taking this file from the working directory and adding it to the staging area. And from this point on, git will start tracking this file, it will start tracking its changes. So from this point on, Git knows that this file, okay, this file may be changed, may be renamed, maybe even deleted, but Git will keep track of all of these changes. All right, so the hello, uh, the hello world file is now at the staging area and it can be said that it's now ready to be committed. So we can confirm this fact by using git status, git status, and we can see that changes to be committed, new file, hello world.py, okay? So our second step in our git mechanism, let's call it this way, is to document a given moment of our project to make some snapshot of all the files inside the staging area. So whenever we make a commit in git, we are basically doing some snapshot of all the files in the staging area, whether they are new, modified, as we will see later on, or anything else. We simply document them at this moment in time. That's one of the most important parts you should know about git. And it looks like this, git commit dash m, okay, dash m, every time you do a commit, use the dash m, and then specify the associated message for this particular commit. So for example, I will go with something, uh, let's say very simple, my first commit using git, okay, let's say it like this, and hit enter. So during your development process, you will always want to take snapshots of your project to document what you have at this particular moment, as well as to be able to compare it with other snapshots that you've done previously. Or if we mess something up, it will simply allow us to come back later on to one of your previous documents, to one of your previous commits, and start right from where you left. So basically, you are likely to use a lot of commits, right? And for every commit, I want you to make sure you associate a descriptive message that will provide a good description of the changes made at this point in time. So for example, here I used uh, just a message, my first commit using git, okay? So better uh, description would be added hello world.py file to the repository. I think it will be better. So I'm leaving it to you, to your practice. And now what I want us to talk about is the fact that once you made a commit, Git will simply take a snapshot of all your files and put them inside of the repository, which 
is basically our third stage as we discussed it previously. So if we will take a look behind the scenes, everything is going to happen in the Git directory, in the .git folder, okay? So now we know that we have our snapshot in this directory and basically we can take a look at all of our commits just by using this command, git log. It will simply show you a list of all of your commits history. So at this point, since we just began our project, we can see that we only have one commit and you can see the exact date when this commit was made. Okay, you can see here the exact date. Uh, you can see the author of this, it's AlphaTech, right? You can see also the email, okay? Here will be your email if you take a look at your project, which is pretty much what we've configured in one of our previous videos. There is also the associated message that you can see here, my first commit using Git, right? And also we can see here some strange number that we will not talk much about it in this crash course. So I guess you guys will agree with me that it's pretty awesome to get all the details uh, of the projects. You, I mean, you can see exactly who committed, when it was committed, why you committed, uh, you made this change, why you documented it. And basically it gives you so much um, so much ability, so much, let's say, options to work on your project to understand where you've made different changes, how you can revert to them and so on. So now if we do git status once again, we will see that we have nothing to commit working tree clean. And this status of git basically says that there are one, there are no new files that git is not keeping track of Otherwise, you would have seen a message like this, right? And also, uh, what this uh, message tells you is that no changes to any of the files that Git keeps track of were made. So, for example, we know right now that we are tracking hello world.py. We know that if we got this mes message that um, there is nothing new, uh, that this file was not modified. Because if we happen to change this file, Git will let us know right away. So that's very important to understand. And once again, if you do now git status, git status, okay, once again, I'm repeating myself, we will see two things. One, that there are no files that Git is not keeping track of. And two, we know that Git keeps track of all changes in the file it's currently tracking. So at this point, we know that there is only one file that Git keeps track of, and that's the hello world.py file. So we can see that there were no changes yet. That's it. So I hope that's clear, guys. These notes are very important for your success in this video uh, and in this course, basically by using git and now we've come to the end of this video and I can tell you that I, I guess you can feel it that this video was not an easy one but you've covered so much and you know now the basics of git uh, workflow which is pretty awesome so I hope that's clear guys and I wish you good luck to practice it a little bit write this commands on your own. Make sure you understand every step that we've shown in this video. And I wish you a great day and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye. What is going on guys? So I've been thinking about if I should add this video to this crash course and I decided that let's practice how it works a little bit more. So first of all, let's create an additional file in our project. We will call it greetings.py. So simply use something like this, touch greetings, greetings.py or directly create it from the notepad plus plus, whatever you like. So let's go uh, now to the file. We know it's empty, so let's just navigate to there. So here we are, here we are. We have our two files, hello world, greetings. So let's edit it with notepad, okay? You could just create it here, okay? It doesn't matter. I just like to work with this command to show you how touch works. And now what I want this program to do is, let's say we just want it to be very simple, greetings, so just print welcome message, welcome message. 
and save it. So hello world.py file, all it does is to print hello world and all this program does is to print welcome. Although these programs are very simple, okay, the concepts that you learn here by using git and version control flow, of course, you can see it, it can be applied to much bigger programs, to much uh, complex uh, projects and you understand why. And now let's go to our git bash. So where it is, git bash. And here we are going to write our git status. So git status, and you can see that we have an untracked file just like we had previously. And this file is the new file called greetings.py. So if we want to track this file, if we want git to track this file, it's very simple, just use git add and the file name of the file that you want to track. So git add greetings.py. And now this file was moved from the working directory to the staging area and it's ready to be committed to the git repository. So let's make the commit. So git commit dash m and let's specify a descriptive message. Let's say added greetings greetings file all right and now if we do git status we will see that everything is clear just like we expected and if we do git log we can see all the commits we've done which in our case is just two commits so let's just make sure that it's actually what we can see so one commit was done in our previous video right it was my first my first commit using git and the second commit is exactly what we've done right now. Here it is. Here is the date. Here is the previous date. Also, you can see the author uh, information, the name, the email. Okay, so I guess uh, so I guess you understand it a little bit better by now. So we took a snapshot of the system once again and added it to the repository. And the difference between the two snapshots of the project, the one that we've done right now and the one that we've done in the previous video, is described by this associated message, this added greetings.py uh, file, okay, added greetings file. So that's the difference that we describe in words between the previous, uh, the previous snapshot that was here and the current snapshot that, uh, that, that contains the files, the greetings.py file and the changes if there were to the previous files. Nothing complicated, just some difference between two snapshots. All right, so I hope that's clear. And now what we are going to do is let's modify a little bit our hello world file. So let's go to it, it's right here and let's say that this program prints hello world and then it will also print a goodbye message okay so print goodbye if i'm not mistaken right and we are going to save this file and what do you think will happen now when we will check git status Think about it for a second. We know that Git keeps track of each of the changes in the hello world file, right? We've seen it, we've configured it in the previous video. And this file was changed. We've added this line, this second line, this print goodbye message. So we expect that Git will tell us this much, right? So if we use here git status, we will see that Git tracks the changes in hello world.py file and we can see that it's saying that this file was modified. So now before doing all the git add and git commit thing, like we've done previously to add the changes to the repository, just instead of doing this to one file, let's also modify greetings.py file, shall we? So let's open up this file. Here it is, greetings.py. And let's say that we also want to add some message like print um welcome my friend okay some other message just to modify the file a little bit and we are going to save it go back to our git bash and here we are going to run git status once again and we can see that it tracks these two files greetings.py hello world.py it notice that these two files were modified and basically Git works pretty awesome. It knows when something was modified, how it was modified. And we are going now to add these changes 
uh, this uh, take some and take some snapshot of the project at this particular point in time. So what you have to do right now is to add the new or modified files to the staging area. And there are a couple of ways to do so. And one of them would be by using simply uh, the following command git add dot. This will simply stage all the modified files, all the modified files you can see here to the staging area with just one command. So if you do that, both of the files, hello world.py and greetings.py, both of them are going to be added to the staging area, ready to be committed. But my recommendation when you are developing some more complex apps and doing some bigger projects than what we are doing right now, then never use this command. Although it looks very simple and let's just get over with uh, and simply allows you to get over with uh, what you need to add, but that's not the right way to do so because when you work on complex projects, there will be plenty of files modified and plenty of new files. And before doing any documentation to these files, it would be much better if you check and make sure that every file that you add to the staging area, you know exactly why you are adding it. I mean, there may be hundreds of files or, or let's say just 10 of files uh, that you've modified or created and you don't always want to take all the files from the working directory and add them to the staging area and then commit them. Maybe sometimes you want you to choose exactly what files should be committed at any particular documentation, at any particular commit. Because you remember that every commit that you're going to do requires an associated message with the changes done so far. So not always you would like to take all the files modified and to specify one given commit. You may also uh, take and split it up to a couple of different commits that you can use in some hierarchy method. So my recommendation here will be simply to add the relevant files associated with every change, add them like this to the staging area and then commit them with the relevant message. So for example, git add hello world.py. Okay, in this case, we will basically add both of them. Um, and then you can also see the status, you can do git status, you can see that hello world.py is in the staging area and it's ready to be committed, but changes that are not staged for commit is the modification of greetings.py. So we will also add greetings, greetings.py to the staging area. And now if we check git status, we can see that both of them are inside of the staging area and they are ready to be committed. So now let's do git commit dash m and here you will specify some descriptive message for the second commit that you do. Okay, for the second for oh, for the second or the third commit, right? What was it for the commit? Press enter and you can see that two files in this commit were changed. There were four insertions, two deletions. <coughs> so I hope that's uh, clear guys. And basically there you go. You can also see um, additional examples. Maybe I will add some resources to this video. And just to summarize this video, let's use git log and you can see, right, we have three, we have three different commits. First commit, added greetings that fee, uh, file and some descriptive message for the third commit. And so now at this point, if for some reason you messed up, let's say we opened up now uh, the hello world.py file and by mistake, we deleted everything that uh, was inside of this file. That's not a problem, okay? Because we can simply go back to one of these previous snapshots of the project. You remember when we took them, right? You have here the associated message. You can go back and just work from there. You can revert it to the previous versions. Pretty cool, right? So this is it for this video, guys. You're doing great. Keep moving forward. Keep learning new things and new material. And I'll see you in the next video. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So at this point, we should have our two files, hello world and greetings.py. We've been working on them, made some changes, made some commits. 
And let's say that now you decide to modify the greetings.py file a little bit. So you add some additional code to show some cool image and then ask the user, for example, what he wants to drink. Of course, I will not write all the code for these functionalities right now, but we will rather assume that we can do it and I will just mention it in some basic comment. So for example, show, show, here, that's how you specify a comment in Python. So show some cool greetings image. And then what are you going to do is ask the user what, what he or she wants to drink. So basically that's the code. Here will be inserted your code to display an image. I'm just letting you know that here is the place where it should be. And here is the place to ask the user what he wants to drink some input functionalities, some displaying image functionality. I'm not going to develop it from scratch right now, right? That's just to demonstrate you the concept of how you will do it in your real life projects. So you've made your changes to the project for today and you're feel, feeling pretty good. Okay, you've done some great job. And before you go home, you forget to document to commit the changes you've made uh, to this project today. I mean, this happens a lot, right? You just save your file, then you there you go. Here is your project and you're feeling like, okay, I'm done for today. But you didn't commit it. You didn't document the changes you've done so far. Basically, you're going home very happy. And the next morning you come to the office and the first thing that your boss tells you to do is to commit yesterday's changes because he wants to keep working on some other features or something like that. And you go open up the file. Okay, you open up one file, let's say, and you take a look at all of the files, greetings.py, hello world.py. And you see that one of them has some print commands, some show, some image command, ask for a drink and so on. And that's pretty cool. But your main question is, how do you exactly document the changes that were made? I mean, on every commit that we do, we have to specify a descriptive message that will clearly tell what changes were made from the previous commit. But we don't seem to remember what we've exactly done yesterday. So that's why we can say that we have a problem here. We know that the file contains at this moment, its content is like this, okay? It's located in our working directory, but we cannot, we cannot remember what it was before the changes. So for that, what we should basically want to do is to compare the two files. To compare the greetings.py file that is currently in our working directory, with the greetings.py file that was taken in the last snapshot, that was taken in the last commit, all right? This way, if we compare between the two, we will be able to see the exact differences between them, okay? The exact differences between the files in the working directory and the files that were in our last snapshot, in our last commit. So for that, what we are going to do is just use the git diff command. So you simply go and write git diff and what it will show you is the difference between the working directory files and the files, the tracked files, of course, that are uh, currently, that were currently uh, in your repository. So hit enter and there you go. You can see here a descriptive message between our last commit and you can see that uh, greetings file was a little bit modified. Okay, and what happened here? You basically can see, I will not uh, talk about it, no new line at the end of the file, it's okay. Uh, you can see here the show some cool greetings image that was added and you can see also the ask the user what he or she wants to drink, okay? So now before you add and commit all the changes you've done to your project and these changes were good, you improved your program, but you should document exactly what you've done between the previous snapshot and this current snapshot, Git diff will provide you a very good information. You can see what was added, what was removed and so on. So that's how you use git diff. And also one thing that I want to mention, git diff command may be used in so many variations that of course we will not cover up all of them right now, but it's kind of important for you at least to know that they do exist. So if you do know that uh, git diff can work not only between uh, your working directory and the last commit you've done. 
So then you can just take a look at the syntax and use that for your needs whenever you like. I mean, basically saying you can show the difference between your working directory and the last commit in the repository, which is just what, what we've seen right now. You can also view the difference between two different commits. So if you go something like this, git log, and you can see that you have here three different commits that we've done in our previous videos. So you can take one commit and compare it, find the differences between one commit and the other commit or this commit and this commit. You can use git diff also for that. And it's actually pretty great and very useful. You can also see the differences between files in the staging area and files in the repository. So basically just know how much you can do with git diff and Whenever you will need to use it, you can ask for Git help to understand how you can compare. Uh, it's just the syntax. I mean, how you can make the differences and see the differences between two different commits, how you can see the differences between working directory and last commit and so on. And I think that now we are ready to move forward and we can say that you're doing pretty great guys. We are covering a lot of important topics that will help you in your programming and developer career. So congratulations guys. You know the basics of git diff and that it can be used for comparison between files, commits and so on. Let me know how you're doing so far in this course by leaving some feedback and review. It's really appreciated and helps me a lot. And until next time, have a great day. Welcome back. Now, as you keep working on your amazing project, you will probably notice that it may change over time. New files are being added, new subdirectories, right? You can add new subdirectories, files being changed, right? We've seen how greetings.py changed and hello world may change. And also there may come some time that you're most likely will have to remove a particular file from your Git repository. So in this case, what you want to do is to take the file itself and completely to remove it from the repository. And for that, Git has some cool command that is called Git RM. So let's take a look how it will work in our Git bash. So Git RM stands for Git remove. Okay. So Git remove and here you specify the file name, the file name of the file that you want to remove from your repository. So let's say that we have a couple of files in our Git repository, which we know are tracked by Git, right? And we want to take a look at all of them. So for that, we can use the command of git ls dash files. Okay. So in this case, you can see all the files that are part of your Git repository, which in our case is greetings.py and hello world.py. And as we said, if you want to remove any of these files, you will, you will simply go with git rm and specify the file name, and it will completely remove the file from your Git repository. Pretty awesome, right? You can also use this command to remove multiple files. For example, here we have only two files. You can remove both of them by specifying file name one and then specifying file name two. So if we are going to take a look at uh, in, in this example, you will just go with something like git rm greetings.py and hello world, hello world.py. So now I will not press enter, but if you hit the enter button, it will take both of these files and remove completely from your Git repository. Also, what GitRM knows to do is to remove a directory from the Git repository. So for example, like we've created now a new directory, which is also a part of our project. So uh, you can also remove it later on from your repository. And this can be done also using the GitRM command, just add the dash R flag and here specify the directory name, whatever it is. For now, it was just default new folder. So you just specify the subdirectory or the directory name, and you can remove it from your Git repository. So basically to summarize, as you keep developing your project, you will add new files, you will add new directories, you will change them. And also you may want at some point to remove them. 
to remove at least some of them. And why one way to do so is to use the git rm command. So that's the basic that you need to know about removing files and directories from your git repository. I hope you like this video and I'll see you in the next one. So welcome back guys to a very important video. And in this video, we are going to talk about tagging. So what is tagging basically? What this concept even means? So it's a very common ability used in actually most modern version control systems nowadays. And it's used to tag given points in the history of the repository to tag different points like a very important points. Okay, so you have a history. Okay, and you need to like to tag and to specify important points during this history. And probably this will be a history of commits. And you see guys, it's very useful whenever you're uh, going to work on some medium or large size projects, then in this case, you are going to have a lot of commits, a lot of repository history and so on. So for example, just like all of the commit history we've seen, I guess, in one of our previous videos using the git log command, okay, you remember this one. Um, this simply demonstrates how the development process and how the development history looks like, okay, so that's the whole commits. And while there is pretty much all the information we actually need to keep on working, I think that's not going to be that easy since there is a bunch of information, a lot of commits, and that's not going to be very <laughs> intuitive to dig into all of the uh, these large data, searching for different things out there, right? What do you think, guys? And that's one of the main reasons as to why we are going to use, we're going to learn and then to use uh, the tagging concept uh, and to tag specific points in the history of our repository. So if you guys already work at some development position, then you may be familiar with this term product or feature release, right? And git tags are usually used to mark these kinds of releases. So that's very important to know um, how to tag different versions of something that is very important. And just to summarize the, the two main reasons as to why we may consider using git tags. Okay, so first of all, I explained to you guys why we may even uh, consider using it and then we'll see the how. So the main two reasons would be uh, that uh, first of all, for the creation of important points in the history of the repository, uh, so that it will be easier to restore some points in time. And also another usage is to mark different releases. Okay, so I hope that's clear so far. And now it's time to talk about the how how can we use tags and how can we create tags? So if we want to create a tag, okay, then all we have to do is simply to use the following command. So git tag and here specify the tag name. And this will basically create a tag with a given tag name in the history of our repository. So let's use like git tag uh, version one. Okay. So oh, what happened? Git tag version one. One second. What's going on here? Ah, it should be like version one. Okay. So git tag version one one. And now we created a tag. And if we want to view the list of all the existing tags in git, then we can go like git tag. Okay, and you will see okay, then we have just one tag, another command that maybe also use this git tag dash dash list, this will do pretty much the same. And it will show you all the tags uh, basically listed in an alphabetical order. All right. And if we 
if we already have some big project that we've been working on with multiple tags, then it makes sense to search for tags with a specific name or with a specific pattern. So for example, you can go and write down like something git tag. Okay, let's first of all create also a new tag. So git tag. Uh, let's create like v1.1. Okay, so that's additional version, additional tag. And for example, we want to search like, I don't know, for tags with a specific name. So git tag dash L and v1. I don't know, everything that starts with v1. Um, and press enter. Basically, this will show you just these first v.1.1 tag. So what I think that you may be using if you're already um, if you're already working on some project, usually there is something like that there are uh, there is uh, a release candidate tags, right? I assume that you've seen these tags pretty much these release candidates, it looks like dash rc1 dash rc2. So one way to look for release history is also to use the git tag dash l and to search for everything you need with uh, whatever release candidate you need. So you know how to search for tags in git. All right. Awesome. So what else can be said about tags in git? Well, basically, there are two main options to use tags in Git. The first tag is a lightweight tag, while the other tags, okay, the other option is an annotated one. And the difference is very simple. The annotated tag gives you also the option to associate a given message to the tag. Okay, so here we just created some name for the tag. And for example, let's say we wanted to create a new tag for version, I don't know, let's create a new version, let's create git tag v uh, git tag v 2.2. Okay. And <clears throat> we also want to specify some descriptive message for this tag. So to do that, we will go with something like this. So git tag dash a v 2.2 and dash m for this descriptive message. So this will be like descriptive message of this 2.2 tag. Um, da -da -da. Ah, it already exists. So basically this command uh, will work only if you create a new tag. So let's make it like v2.2.1 just to demonstrate the creation. So uh, basically, whenever you would like to create a new tag with a descriptive message that says about why you have created this tag. So simply use it like this git tag and a flag specify the tag name and also a descriptive message regarding this tag. So now when you hit enter, a new tag will be created and it will be stored as a complete git object in the repository of our project. And if we haven't spoken yet about git objects, no worries, hopefully we will do that soon enough. I think I will also add it in this course. So yeah, let's, let's move further, right? Let's clear this screen. And now let's say you've been working um, on your amazing project and you come to the office one morning and you're not 100% certain that some edits and some additions and some something that you've been working on your project that you've um, made, you're not certain that you've made your um, in your last uh, tag. So basically, you're not sure. Well, <laughs> what I want to show you guys, I, I got, got a little bit lost. I just want to show you that uh, there may be times when you are not certain about some additions that you've made to the project on uh, in your last tags. So one way that you would be able to go and search for that given commit one by one using like, I don't know, like git log, and hopefully trying to locate it. While the other option, since you remember that you tagged this specific point in time, 
you can go and use something like this. So git show, git show, and here specify the tag name. And this will show all the details regarding a particular tag. So for example, um, you may use it like git show and specify what was it version 2.2.1, right? It's something like this. So you will be able to see all the information associated with this particular tag. Okay, you will be able to see the tag name, who made uh, the tag itself, who also made, I don't know, what was it, who also made all the, the commits, the commit uh, SHA, the commit SHA, also the changes that were made, and so on and so forth. Which is pretty cool and it, and it can give you a lot of very useful information. So awesome, I think it's pretty cool. And now, finally, let us talk about a situation. Let's first of all clear the screen. Let us talk about a situation where we've created some unnecessary tag that we would like to delete. Okay, so how can we do it? Let's first of all say that you've created a tag. So git tag dash a, let's go like v1.1.1 dash m, I don't, I don't know, just the sign a very, very good, very good release of version 1.1.1. Okay. And now you simply realize that you don't need this tag, and you want to delete it. So it won't be part of your repository. All right, things like this may also happen. You made a mistake, you want to remove some tag. So how should you do that? Basically, there are two options. Or better say let's no, let's just talk about one common option. So git tag dash dash delete, and then specify the tag name. So in our case, we will simply specify instead of the tag name, just v 1.1.1. And that will delete the tag itself. So now if you will check for all the existing tags, you will see that this particular tag has been deleted. And I think that makes sense. All right, so this is it for this video, guys. Uh, I tried to cover up as much as possible. I think that you already know about git tags. By this point, you know about the commit history. You understand that this history may be very, very long. And not every commit is super important, right? Because you may have so many commits. And one way to kind of prioritize and to specify what commits are very useful is just to use the git tags and to specify these commits with some associated descriptive message. So thank you so much for watching and keep on practicing. Keep on going over the material, writing down notes. I will try to create some uh, summarized, maybe PDF version of these, uh, of all the commands here and share it with you. So it will be also easier for you. So if you need it, please let me know that I will uh, create it as soon as possible. Thank you guys. And I will see you then. What is going on guys? And welcome back to another very interesting video where we are going to talk about how can we unstage a staged file, all right? So let's say that you have these two nice files that you've been working on. Let's call them, I don't know, uh, what should we call them? Let's call them file one and file two, all right? So the i file one, let's make it file one.py. Let's just use here print, I'm file one. And also, <clears throat> we will have file two, which will be pretty much the same just for file two. So I'm file two. Okay, so there you go. We created these two files. We've been working on them for quite a bit. And let's say that both of these files, all right, both of them 
are completely different and provide completely different functionalities. Okay, so file one is responsible for one thing, file two for another thing. Although the content of these files uh, is pretty much the same, but that's just uh, for making it simple as much as possible. But you get the idea. Two different files, two different functionalities. And that's why you know that the changes done to both of them should be committed separately. Okay, so the changes you've done to file one and the changes you are doing to file two should be committed in two separate commits. So this way you will specify a descriptive message for uh, the additions and the changes you've done to file one. And then once you're done with this specific commit, you will also go and do the same with another commit with another descriptive message for file number two. So you would like basically to make here two different commits, one after the other. And although you know this much, and you know that what you should do is basically just to add the first file to the staging area, and then to make the first commit, right? So basically just use something like this, git add file one to the staging area and then do some commit. And right after that, right after the first commit, you should go and add the second file to the staging area. And then once again, to do, the, to do additional commit, a separate commit just for the changes you've done in file two. So awesome. That's basically what you should do. Okay. But in life, just like in real life, things don't do not always seem to go exactly as we expect them to. In, and instead of adding just the first file to the staging area, just adding file one, by mistake, we also added the second file, okay, by accident, right? So things happen. And that's a mistake. Oops. This can happen. And a lot of the beginners, once they are done this step, simply seem to panic once it's done, okay, because they did not want that it will look like this, okay, so that both of these files are staged and ready to be committed. They wanted just the first file to be ready to be committed. But that's not the case. And we should do something with it, okay, we cannot simply use this git commit dash m with some descriptive message because we have to, to specify an associated message for different commits, of respectively for each of these files. So what we would like to do is basically to take one of these files, file one or file two, let's say file two, to take this file from the staging area, okay, to take it from the staging area, and bring it back, bring it back to the working directory. So that this way, the staging area will have only file one, okay. And basically, once we know what we want to do, we can start working. And we what we want to do is pretty much very simple. So we are going to take this file, this second file. And basically, uh, if you take a close look, okay, in this kind of nice output that you can see here by using the git status, you will be able to see that changes to be committed, new file, file one, new file, file two. But there is also a nice message in these parentheses that specifies exactly what you're looking for. So in this case, we are looking for how to unstage, how to take it from the staging area, how to take this file from the staging area and bring it back to the working directory. And one way to do so would be simply to read what the git status command uh, gives us. And <clears throat> there is actually few ways to do so. And one of the ways is really to like to rely on what is said here. So git restore, okay, that's the command restore it, a staged file, okay, restore it. And here instead of the file, 
we will specify just the file name that we want to restore from the staging area to the working directory. So it will look like this, file2.py. And now if we are going to do git status, you will see that this file, file2, is not under the staging area anymore. And this file is untracked as it was previously before. It has been moved from the working directory, which Git didn't even track it by, by, by this point. And it took it from the staging area and put it back to where it was previously. So that's a nice way. And now you can do your commit and do git commit, specify, edit, file one and so on and so forth, and then add the second file and make another commit. So that's a nice way to go. And this git restore dash dash staged is a nice command that you should be familiar with. But I have a couple of words to say about it because um, if I'm not mistaken, until a certain version, um, there was a lot of usage for uh, you with using the following command. So in some tutorials, you may also see instead of the command that we've just used this git restore dash dash staged. Some tutorials, you will also see the git reset head and then specifying the file name, okay, for unstaging, okay. So git reset head, and if we would have specified here file one, just just to demonstrate what will happen here, you will see now that if we do git status, then this previous command, it simply has, it simply has taken uh, a certain file and just unstaged it. Okay, so git reset head file. So this way, the file was unstaged. And I think that uh, the previous command that we've just shown, it's um, more updated command that is being used since git version, I think if I'm not mistaken, 2.23. And I really do recommend using this command. But it's really important for you like to know this syntax. Because I think it's too early in this course to talk about this head. Okay, and what's happening here behind the scenes using this reset command. But I think it doesn't really matter for now. Uh, maybe we will cover uh, a deeper understanding in, in the uh, next chapters in this course. But for now, just be familiarized with both of these approaches. I think you may uh, need it at, at least one or two times in your career. Okay, maybe and probably even more. So now you know how to unstage a staged file in uh, your Git repository. So thank you guys for watching. Let me know if you have any questions. And until next time, I will see you then. Bye bye. All right. So in this video, we are going to talk about how to unmodify a file, how to revert. That's a very important topic. And it's actually one of the main things that you should probably be familiar with. And one of the things that you are going to use very often. I think, yeah, very often, how to unmodify a modified file, how to revert it back, and so on and so forth. So with that being said, let's get started. So suppose you've been working on a given file, let's say, I don't know, the hello world.py, let's see what, what files do we have here. Okay, so um, what files do we have here? We have, let's use ls. So we have hello world. Let's just see the content of hello world. So cat hello world, print hello world and print goodbye. Let's just modify this file a little bit. So vi hello world. Let's say we added some functionality that knows how to print uh, today, today's temporary. Tempor Temperature. <laughs> okay, so now it's how to print today's temperature. Um, yeah, and that's it. Okay, so we've been working on this file, we've made some additional changes and simply realized that 
these changes that we've just done are unnecessary okay there is no reason why why in this file hello world there will be information today's temperature okay let's say that it doesn't make any sense to include this kind of message basically realizing that all the changes you've made since the last commit are just not what you need and that you want to remove them and start from a clean page or basically where you've left off since your last commit okay that's what we want to do to continue from our last commit that included only this information without these changes we've just proposed okay one way to, to go about it is simply to open up the hello world file and to delete this line okay but usually that's not the case and it's not so easy because we may uh, we may be made a lot of changes and it's hard to like to go line by line and deleting it and comparing it with the previous commit a better option would be like we know that the previous commit or one of the previous commits are fine and they are good and that's what we want to to work with then a better way will be like to get this previous file instead of the current file we are working on okay so let's take a look let's run the git status command hit enter and you can see that the hello world.py file was modified <clears throat> and you may also take a look at its um, differences okay how it was modified during the commits history by using the diff command right that's something that we also know how it can be done and at this point you know that the file itself is modified and all you want to do is just to revert these changes so how should you do it so basically if you take a look at the output of the git status command okay you will see that it already <laughs> lets you it, it already gives you a bunch of information a bunch of useful information uh, sometimes exactly what you're looking for so you can see here you have git restore ta -ti -ta -ta -tum, and the file itself to discard changes in working directory so what it does is basically it tells you explicitly how you should go about okay how you should go about it and discard the changes you've made okay so let's try let's try to run this command together and see what happens so currently just to remind you that's the content of the hello world file that we have that's the content of the hello world file in our last commit and what we want to do is to run this command to restore the previous let's say version of the file that was in our last commit so git restore and then the file name which is in this case in this case it's hello world so git restore hello world and there you go all the changes you've made to the file to this file since the last commit should be basically gone so let's use cat hello world and see the content of this file and basically you can see that um, you've managed to complete your probably first revert operation using git and to unmodify a modify file uh, in your working directory and taking it back to your previous commit and proceeding from there so what I can tell you for now is just congratulations this command is so useful and I really hope that you've understood exactly what we've done here okay so we we we've been working on a file there is a commit history for a given file and you know that now you're working you edited the file and you want to restore it to be exactly as it was in the last commit so that's exactly what git restore does and before we proceed it's very important something that i want to tell you is very important to understand that this command this git restore 
is also kind of dangerous and that it should also be used with caution. And the reason is very simple. Since you know that if you take and revert a modified file in your working directory and you kind of undo all the changes you've done, all right, so you've, you have some file in the commit uh, history, it's already documented and so on. And also you've been working on this hello world file which looked like this. And once you've done this restore operation, okay, to restore and to work with the previous commit uh, version of this file, then in this case, any local changes you've made like this to this file, this hello world file will be gone. And all Git actually done behind the scenes is simply replacing your modified files with the most recent version of that file in your last commit, which is this one. So my suggestion, okay, maybe you, you've made this change, but you, uh, you, you remember that, oh, I shouldn't uh, done it, maybe I can get this information somehow, this printing line or maybe additional line. That will be a problem. Um, so that's why I suggest you um, to only use this command when you're 100% sure that there is no chance you're going to need these changes that you've made to your file locally because they will be probably gone right after you execute this command. So, of course, there may be a better approach for some scenarios without including the explicit uh, restore and completely removing the previous file. For example, when using a git diff command and removing just the necessary parts, for example, right? It's also not, basically you should, you should always look at your situation and try to figure out what is the best approach for you. But I'm here just to give you this information, give you some guidelines, give you some notes of precaution and so on. And then you can decide based on your needs what command is better for, for, for you. So I hope that's clear so far. It's a super important video on one of the popular Git functionalities. Oh, and one last thing for this video. If for any reason you would like to keep the changes done to the file but still need to get it out and get the previous unmodified version from the version the previous commit for now uh, then it's also something we are planning to cover up in one of our I guess future sections and future videos where we are going to talk about stashing and about branching concepts hopefully uh, both of them will be discussed in this course Maybe now, maybe, uh, yeah, I think I think they will be discussed. Um, yeah, so also what I wanted to show you in this video is maybe, 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 no, it doesn't really matter now. Maybe some of you just, um, yeah, we'll discuss it later on. So last note for this video is regarding the warning I've told you about using this command, just keep in mind that almost anything that was committed in Git can be recovered in this way or another, okay? So all the information that was committed, probably it's, it's optional to recover most of it most of the time. And that's one of the main parts using version control system. But data and information that you lose in your working directory just like we've done here, which was not yet committed, that's something that may be gone forever. So bear this in mind, guys, um, and understand this topic completely. So thank you so much for watching, and we will meet again soon enough. All right, guys, welcome back to another section in our Git and GitHub crash course. And before we proceed, I want to ask you a simple question. What is a remote version control system and why do we even need one?
I mean, we already have Git, which is also a version control system, and we already know how to use it to track files, to track changes in our project, and so on. Everything seems to be great so far, so why should we even think of anything else? Why do we need something remotely? And the reason is very simple. Git is great for managing your repository and working on your project, especially locally, right? But at the beginning of the course, we said that we want to be able to do the following things. We said that first of all, what we want is to be able to track the changes, meaning version control, and that's something that pretty much can be done using Git. But also what we wanted to have is the ability for collaboration. We know that probably if you're going to work on some big project, on some complex project, you're not going to do it alone. So you have your team and you want all of your team to work on one and the same project. Although that's still possible just by using Git, but if we'll do so, it's going to be way too messy. So that's one of many good reasons as to why we need some remote version control system for the development of our project. And before we proceed, I want to show you some really cool example that will demonstrate in more detail what is the problem and what solution you may need. So in this example, I want to show you why we may need a remote repository. So let's start with something very simple. Think about some project where you are going to develop the next social media platform. And to develop this platform, you have your talented team, John, Emily, and Mike, and each of them has to develop some functionality. So for example, John has to develop the functionality of uploading posts, Emily has to develop the functionality of playing videos, and Mike has to develop uh, the sending messages functionality. And of course, there is much more to it to develop a cool social media platform, but this will be enough for our example. So I hope that's clear so far, and if we take a look at each of these developers, we can see that each of them is developing its functionalities locally. But also you can see that each of these developments is actually Th these parts are separated. We need some place to organize and contain all of these parts, to contain all of this project with all of its different parts in just one place. So maybe we need some remote repository, some cloud-based repository for our project. So this way, each of the developers will be able to add his changes and additions to this general repository. You will have your project repository locally, okay? John, Emily, and Mike, all of them are going to have their repository locally, where they are going to keep on developing new functionalities. And also we'll have some remote repository, which will kind of gather everything up. So that's how we want our teammates to work from now on. And during the development, all of them are going to contribute their parts to the cloud-based repository. And all the team is going to push their changes from their local environment to the remote repository. And you and your teammates will will do the push and then you are going to see the project as a whole on the remote repository and once you are done you also will be able to get different parts of the project for example you can see that john once he gets the project the repository the remote repository he will be able also to view the files that emily and mike were working on so in this case these files are just file number two and file number three and also emily can get the new repository the new project that contains uh, that wraps all of the pushes let's say for now that john mike and emily done previously and you can see that all of them can take uh, and work on the new um, additions of files, of folders, and so on. So I hope this reason is clear to you guys uh, for how you can collaborate. And we are going to see 
in this in the next section we are going to see a lot of practical examples of how it can be done using git and github so stay tuned regarding to this uh to this topic and while it's great for collaboration there is also additional benefit as to why you should keep a copy of your local repository in some remote repository. You will have an online backup of your local repository. I mean, you will have a copy of your project in some cloud-based repository that is not on your computer. So that's another reason why you should consider using remote version control system. So I hope these reasons are clear to you guys as to why you should consider using a remote repository. And that's very important to understand why you are using something before we just dive into using it, right? It wouldn't make sense for me not to make this explanatory video, this introduction video before we just jump and create different things and use different remote repositories. So this is it for this video, guys. Let me know if you liked it or not. Let me know how the, the course is so far for you, if you enjoy it, if you like the material. And I wish you a great day and we'll see each other in the next video. <laughs> Bye. So now that you know why we need it, we can proceed to choose the exact remote version control system that we will be working in this course. And while there are a couple of options to choose from, such as GitLab, Bitbucket and a few more, we are going to go with the most used nowadays Git repository hosting service and that's GitHub. So chances are high that you've heard about these guys, this guy at least once. I mean, there was a lot of buzz when Microsoft acquired GitHub for about 7.5 billion dollars. Pretty amazing, right? Aside from that, GitHub is also considered to be, at least for now, the largest community for developers in the world. As a matter of fact, there are over 100 million repositories on GitHub and there are over 40 million users. So many users and so many repositories as well as being backed by Microsoft. Not bad guys, right? So that's our new friend, GitHub. And if we would like to summarize in pretty much just one sentence of what GitHub is, we can say that it's a Git repositories hosting service that has code collaboration and version control tools for repositories management. Something like that. So with that being said, I've introduced you a little bit with GitHub. Let us create a new account, configure it and start working with GitHub. Let's go. What is going on guys and welcome back to another video in our Git and GitHub crash course. And in this video what we are going to do is to set up and create a new GitHub account. And for that we need to specify to fill out this form right here. So specify your username. I'm going to go with let's say alpha tech and it seems to be unavailable. So your username may also be unavailable and you have here some suggestions. I'm going just to modify to work with alpha teacher. Okay, alpha teacher. And here you're going to specify your email account. And this email account basically will be associated with your GitHub with your GitHub uh, username, uh, with your GitHub account, sorry. So specify here your email and specify correct email because uh, GitHub is going to verify your account using this email that you specify right here. And now just use some password that you want uh, your account to work with. Hit up the sign up for GitHub button and you're going to be redirected to this little nice page that will verify that you are a real person. So click on verify and touch the arrows. Let's make this dog to oh, 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 be looking nice. So, okay, so done, 7.2 seconds, that was good. And now what we are going to do is to join a free plan. So hit this button and we are going to be redirected to where GitHub wants to know us more. GitHub wants to know in what we are interested in and so specify basically all the information about you. So whether you're a student, a software engineer, a product manager, a teacher or whatever you are. And
and then specify some experience regarding programming that you have if you have a little a lot of experience and then you there you go you have also additional fields to fill out and click on complete setup and once you hit the complete setup section you also have to go to your email account and verify that uh, it's really you and it's really your email account and once you are done I'm going to show you where you should be redirected to at last so here you see that actually you have to verify your email address otherwise you cannot you cannot proceed so go to your email address verify it and then once your verification is over you're going to see the following page so now once your email address is verified you can go to the home page and you can see that right now you are already signed in uh, to your github account and you can see here a lot of things that we are going to discuss right away so basically guys congratulations for setting up your first github account and now it's time to explore it a little bit i'll see you in the next video so now once you created your github account and you are signed in there are a couple of important things that i want to mention here the first one is that on the left here you can see all of your repositories that are hosted on github currently we have no repositories so it's empty it makes sense and here using this create repository button you can actually create a new repository on github and that's exactly what we are going to do in the next video we will also cover up all the steps required to create it as well as talk about the differences between private and public repositories another thing that we have here is the explore github button so before i before we dive into it i just want to to mention uh, something to you guys that you should be aware that the github interface it may change with time right i mean this button in a in a couple of months and after i've recorded it may appear here and also the create repository may be here i don't know but the logic and the idea of exploring and creating new repositories should remain pretty much the same so no worries if for some reason reason this button appears not not in place where the video is being recorded at the moment so basically we have this explore github functionality and we can see here different projects that other people are working on and usually these projects that you can see here are going to be based on other projects that you stared or based on topics that you've shown interest in so for example you can also explore different projects based on something that you want to know for example let's say that we want to know different projects that are dealing with the coronavirus that interests us today so you can see that there are 25,000 repository results that you can see on coronavirus and there are a lot of different things that people are doing different visualities different uh, reverse engineering and so on so you can basically find any project that looks interesting to you and work with it uh, check it out and uh, suggest your additions suggest new features and to collaborate on github so now let's go back to our explorer section so what i said is that here are going to be a lot of projects based on uh, different projects that you liked or shown interest in which is pretty much similar to how most of the social media platform uh, feeds work today and in the next videos we are going to see how we can collaborate and how we can work on any of these projects so also what we can see here in the explore section we can see here the topics uh, where you can take a look at different repositories in a particular subject area so for example you have topics for 3d you have topics on android angular arduino and basically you got the point you have also topics for compilers for covid19 c++ and many more so just think about some topics that interest you and go check out different projects on git hub that work with them you can also take a look at the trending and the collections that you can see here 
Yeah, and there is also events and you got the idea. So feel free to spend some time on this awesome platform and find what interests you the most. So that's it for our quick introduction with our two exploring GitHub. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video. All right, guys, welcome back to another video in our Git and GitHub crash course. And before we proceed, I would like to ask you to pause the video and take a minute to leave some feedback on the course and on the material you've learned so far. It's very important for me to know how you're doing in this course. So thanks a lot. And now let's move on with GitHub. So we can say that GitHub, it's just a website, which we already explored a little bit in our previous videos, right? You can simply host here your own repositories and let your teammates work with you on the same project even at the same time. And now we can create our first project or our first repository in GitHub. So simply click on create repository. And now you can see who, who is the owner of this repository. Okay, if you have multiple accounts, you will see all of them here. Uh, you will be able to uh, choose your desired account. And here you specify the repository name. So let's go with something like first git project. And that will be and that will be our name for this repository. Now we also will add some description, which is optional, but I always like to add something that will describe my projects. So we will go with something like this, let's say alpha tech, git, and GitHub, right, Git and GitHub crash course. This will be some basic description of my repository. You add something for your own projects, describe what you are doing in this repository, give, give a good name uh, for your repositories and your projects. And basically now we have to choose from of, of these two options, private and public. So basically, what does it mean? Why will somebody want to make their project public, right? Well, the reason is very simple, because first of all, I mean, why not? I mean, keeping your project private is nice, but wouldn't it be better to share it with other people? If that's not some top secret project, but rather it's something that you're just building up, then why not share it with others? And the side to just sharing it with other people, uh, there are also some strict benefits for you as you do so. For example, people who are interested in your project will be happy to take part in its development. Since it's an online repository, right? It's hosted on GitHub. A lot of people that may be interested in your project, they may contribute their additions, their new features, code rearrangement, and even they may find bugs in your project. And all of that thanks to the fact that you share your project with others who find interest in it. So we are all here on GitHub to help one another to practice and to make awesome projects. But if you still want to host your repository as private, so there is no problem, GitHub gives you this option. And just that you will know, back then, a couple of years ago, hosting a private repository on GitHub would have cost you about $7 a month, if I'm not mistaken. But now, at least to these days that I'm recording this course, it's totally free. So feel free to use GitHub as a cloud-based repository service for your projects, whether they are going to be private or they are going to be public. And also in one of our previous videos, we said that there are over 100 million repositories on GitHub. And just that you will know that about 30% of them are public repositories, which is pretty nice, right? There are so many projects that people share publicly with other people and collaborating and improving them. Awesome. So now let's proceed. And here you can select the initialize this repository with a readme, which is basically some informative file describing your project and all of its usages to other developers and users. But for now, we will leave it as is because later on, we can always add it. 
You can also choose some license, right? You can see here some license for your project. And there is also the dot git ignore. That's something that we are going to cover in the next section in the next videos in this course. So for now, leave it as is and just create your GitHub repository. So click on create repository. And here you go, you can see that your new repository was created. So congratulations, guys, you've made your first GitHub project your first remote GitHub repository. And now you can see here a couple of options that GitHub gives you as a suggestion on how to proceed from here on. You can use these steps to create a new, a new local repository and then connect it with GitHub. Or as in our case, uh, if we already have created our local repository, like we've done in the previous section, we may go with the second option and choose to push an existing repository from the command line. So GitHub also tells you what exact commands you should do to push the local repository that we've made in our first Git project to GitHub to this uh, web based cloud repository. And that's basically something that we are going to do together in the next video. So guys, stay tuned. And I hope everything is clear so far. And before we finish this video, I would like to quote some phrase from one of the GitHub official videos. And it will summarize a little bit what we discussed about making public uh, projects and collaborating on GitHub. So that's how it goes. GitHub is where people build software. It's how they build software together. <laughs> and I think you've got the idea. So with that being said, thank you guys for watching. Keep on studying, keep on moving forward, and you're about to succeed. I'll see you soon. Welcome back guys to another video in our Git and GitHub crash course. And in this video, what we are going to do is to take our local repository that we've just created, our local Git repository, all of the files that we've added, modified and committed in our previous section, and to take this repository and to push it to the repository we've created on GitHub to the remote repository. So once we make our push from the local to the remote, we will have a full copy of our local repository here on GitHub. And basically, what will be the steps to do so? And basically, if you take a look at what GitHub gives you at GitHub information, you can see that if you already have an existing repository, then all that you have to do in order to take your local repository and to push it into GitHub is to follow these uh, two commands. So GitHub basically tells you exactly what you should do now. And what we are going to do is first of all, to take a look at this link you have here at this URL. So that's basically your repository on GitHub. Okay, so github.com, your username, and your Git repository. So let's go to the Git bash and configure our remote repository. Uh, just by setting up a connection when we are going to execute this command. So simply copy it and paste it here. And you will see that what we are doing right now is to Oh, I'm sorry, let's first of all, let's first of all, navigate to our directory. So it was under here, you can see desktop first git project. So change directory to desktop, desktop and git first git project. Okay, make sure that you are inside of this directory. And now we are going to paste here the command that GitHub tells us that we should do. And all this command does is simply to configure the local repository that its remote repository will be on this link on GitHub. So press enter and press enter. And there you go. So now we have a connection to our remote GitHub repository. And basically just for you to understand this command what it does um we use here the origin and it's simply some sort of an alias a nickname for our git github repository or for our remote repository so instead of writing down every time this url we are just going to use origin instead in fact you may basically use anything, uh, any nickname that you like it's just the default to use origin uh, here so there you go, you configured it correctly. And at this point, um, we can run git remote. And you can see here the origin. And if you run git remote dash V, 
you can see that the remote repository URL configured correctly and you can fetch and you can fetch uh, anything from this URL and you can also push anything from your local repository to this particular particular URL by specifying this nickname origin and origin. And when I say pushing, pushing something, it simply means to take your local files in your local directory, in your local repository and push them to the online GitHub repository. So awesome. Now what we have to do is to run the second command and it's git push origin master. So just go git push push take the local to the remote origin specifies the URL and master is our branch. Uh, we will talk more about branches later on in this course. So don't worry about it. We will also cover it up this master. So git push you know what it means origin you know that it specifies the URL configured remotely and master is our branch that we are working and developing right now. So I hope that's clear. Let's press enter and usually it takes a few seconds and once the operation is completed, oh, here we have an error. And what's the problem? It says that the remote repository was not found. So what is the problem? What was the problem right now? Let's check it out. So we can see here that the problem is the repository was not found, meaning we couldn't push into our repository on GitHub. And the reason for that is very simple and it's because we created our repository as a private. So if we create it as a, as a private, we should already take different steps for working with it, but we also can uh, set it up to be public right? We can also set it up always to be public. And that's exactly what I want to show you right now, because there may be a lot of times when you will decide to, for example, make your project from private to public. So then uh, different people may uh, show interest in your project and work with you on one and the same project. And also for some reason, maybe you created your project as public and you also want to know how to make it private. So that's exactly what we are going to find out right now. So press settings and now we are going to see here in the settings, we are going to go down, go down, down, down in the danger zone. Let's see what we can find out here. So change repository visibility. Currently this repository is private and we are going to change it. So press on change visibility, make the repository public. And now you are going to see what will be the steps or basically what it will uh, make your project from now on that the code will be visible to everyone who can visit github.com. Anyone will be able to fork the repository and the changes will be published as activity. So now just make sure that you specify uh, this message to confirm that it's exactly what you want to do. So here you go, I understand, change repository visibility. And there you go, now your GitHub project is configured to be public. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? And I just want to clarify a couple of things and a couple of questions that I've been asked lately. So basically, you can push, fetch and do any other operation with your remote repository on GitHub even if it's being private, all right? There is no necessity to work on your own projects only if they are public. And that's very important to clear out after the end of the previous video where I simply wanted to show you how you can change the visibility of your repository from private to public and vice versa. That's all. That's just what I wanted to show you there, okay? And maybe for some reason, uh, it kind of looked like uh, that uh, you can only do it with a public repository or with a private repository. And yeah, that's totally not it. Okay. And we are going to see in the next video and in the video afterwards how we can do it properly. So once again, you can push your repository to uh, your local repository to the remote repository even if it's private. Okay. Awesome. And regarding the question of how this can be done, 
that's something we are going to see in the next videos where we are going to configure some SSH keys and to understand how this whole process works in general and using GitHub remote in particular. So I've decided to add a dedicated video explaining just the methodology and the process of working with SSH so that <clears throat> the lesson after the next one where we are going to set up the connection in practice will be even easier for you to grasp and to understand and like to take uh, to take advantage of the material you are going to learn. Okay, so I hope you are ready and here we go with our general SSH explanation that basically in my opinion I think that you as a future or a current developer must be, be familiar with since this uh, concept, this concept, I don't know if it's, if it's correct to call it a concept, but knowing SSH is something you must be familiar with and knowing how to transfer files between different points on a network is also something you must know. That's basically at least my opinion. So thank you guys for listening. Uh, I hope this clarification is clear to you uh, regarding the private public things and Basically, the next video, I think it's going to be pretty much amazing, okay? It's not 100% like only uh, Git, GitHub version controls and so on. It's basically more related to uh, how the SSH works and looks like behind the scenes and how to transfer different files over the network. So thank you guys for listening and enjoy the next videos. All right, welcome back. So in this video, we are going to talk about the SSH process in general. So in my opinion, I think that the information you're going to get in this video is so important and so valuable that it will take you to the next level. So let's start and simply make some introduction and first of all, talk about what is SSH in general? And we can start with the formal definition that SSH stands for secure shell. It has many, many usages in different situations, especially in managing remote servers and providing the ability to safely connect, log and work from basically anywhere. It was mainly developed due to the fact that its alternative, Telnet, which I suppose you have heard about it here or there, was and still not secure enough and actually can be hacked much easier. And that's not something you want to happen because you want a connection from point, let's say, A to point B to be as secure as possible. So SSH is used for secure remote connections. That's its main usage. Is that clear so far? Good. But what does it even mean like to have a secure connection? I mean, we are going to send, okay? And we are going to receive data from some remote points using some connection. So how, how it can be secured? And simply saying to answer this question, we need first of all to understand one of the most uh, known problems with remote connections. And basically it's the fact that they can be sniffed around and data can be uh, like received by also somebody who is not part of the connection. So suppose we have two endpoints A and B, okay? Um, let's call it point A, point B, and there is some connection between them, okay? They are sending data back and forth. For example, I don't know, on point A, let me get my pen here, on point A, we want to send some message like uh, a password, like one, two, three, okay? So we want to send it from here, and that on the other side, at point B, we will receive this password to be able to log into somewhere. Okay, so this data, okay, this, uh, let me minimize it a little bit. This data, this one, two, three, in this case, okay, this data basically, okay, can be intercepted 
in the middle, okay? So if there is somebody sitting here, okay, and just want to know what data on the line is being sent, then this data is totally compromised, okay? So maybe point B will get this password one, two, three, but also aside to this point, to this uh, uh, recipient, there may be somebody else, okay, who may be sitting like, where is it? Where is this guy? Yeah, so he may be sitting right here and he will also intercept this information in your password to actually log in somewhere. And that's totally something you don't want to happen. So what you do uh, is basically, let's say, uh, let's take a look at this nice example. Let's remove everything from the screen. Okay, so suppose you're at point A, okay, and you want to send some discrete information to your friend, for example, your username and your password. I don't know, maybe you want him to log into your social media account and help um, and to help you out with something, okay, I don't know. So <clears throat> that's basically another example that I want to show you, okay. Uh, and you go, you send your message, you trust the connection, and you assume that everything you're going to send over this connection is going to be transmi transmitted and received safely, right? That's our base assumption. But is that actually the case? Let's try to see what happens, okay? So you go and send your uh, username, let's say you, this username is AlphaTech, and the password is just, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, or anything else. And everything seems to be okay. But in reality, okay, someone was able to see this plain information, okay? Here is this guy from above. He was able to see it on the connection itself. And this information was exposed, both your username and password. And someone was able to simply take this information and use it for his needs, okay? So that's not the best thing that, uh, the best thing that can happen, okay? We saw these two examples, two quite uh, illustrations. And what we would like to do is maybe to add some layer of security that we may use uh, for this transmission, okay? And to explain it in simple words, let's say that this previous plain connection, okay, doesn't use any algorithm or any encryption on the data that is being transferred, okay? We simply take this plain text, this plain password, plain username, and just send it as is over the network until uh, the recipient receives it, okay? So uh, that's basically how you do it and how you don't want to do it, actually. All right, so... <clears throat> Uh, now let's say that we would like to like to add something, some, I, I wouldn't call it like <laughs> kind of encryption, but let's say for simplicity uh, for now, let's add, let's make some rule, okay, because some people are afraid of this word encryption, let's say some rule, okay, every message that we are going to send, okay, what we will do is simply we will take like for every digit that we want to send, okay, that's the original message, okay, that's the original. But what will go over the network will be slightly different, okay, for every character that we have here, we will try to make um, some uh, unusual representation, and after every character, we will simply add, I don't know, two dollar signs, okay? So this way, okay, this way, after, um, after adding it, it will look something like this, okay? It will simply look like one dollar a dollar, two dollar a dollar, three dollar a dollar, which is basically not, uh, not the password itself, okay? And if somebody comes and, I don't know, tries to listen to it, he will not be able, like, to right away understand what was the password, okay? Because... The password requires, okay, two steps operation, an encryption and a decryption. And the encryption in this case is known like add every time two dollars, okay? And then at the decryption phase, you will know like get the first character and afterwards remove the two, uh, let me show you, remove the two dollars, get 
uh, the, uh, the fourth character, remove the two dollars, get the fifth, uh, the seventh character, if I'm not mistaken, remove the two dollars, and there you go, you will get your password kind of a little bit uh, with more uh, with less uh, options to like to be stalled by this man in the middle, okay? So that's uh, one way to add some layer of security and to make it a little bit harder for the intruder to make some problems to us. But as we get smarter, okay, uh, so are the people who want to obtain this information. So that's exactly where the SSH comes in handy. So this kind of algorithm of, of adding the, just uh, some layer like this of security is very, very simple. And usually these intruders can get hold of this idea and to crack it much easier than uh, the ability to crack more complex algorithms. And that's exactly why we are going to talk about SSH now. And we are going to see how it's being uh, and will be implemented in our course. So <laughs> another way to improve, as we just said, another way to improve um, uh, security is to use the SSH or the SSH protocol. And this protocol basically provides you with a strong authentication, a secure connection and strong encryption. So how does it work? Of course, I'm not going to dive with you guys uh, into all the cryptographic, uh, crypto cryptography information, cryptography information here. Okay, but rather, what I'm going to do is just to show you the general concept and things you should definitely understand, both for this course and, to be honest, for your general knowledge as well. So there are asymmetric cryptography algorithms such as RSA and DSA, and they are actually used as a key pair with two separate keys. Okay, let me explain exactly what I mean. So we are going to create an SSH key pair on our local machine. Okay, that will include two keys. Okay, the first one is the public key. And this key is going to be used to grant us access to our remote Git repository, okay? Whether that's going to be on GitHub, GitLab, or any other server. So on our remote server, we are going to specify this exact public key in the authorized keys section. And this means in simple terms and without diving into complicated details, that who has the corresponding and associated private key, which was also generated as part of this SSH key pair, then this guy will be granted an access to the server. Okay, so generating two keys, the public key is going to the server, the private key remains on our side. And basically, uh, who will have the private key will be able to access the server. Okay, so that's just a uh, a quick introduction, a quick explanation. And the second key is, of course, like I just said, is the private key. And this key should never lose the user side and should always remain only with the user. This private key is an actual proof of the user's identity. That's why they are also called identity keys. So once again, just to summarize everything we've talked about here, without getting into all the encryption decryption things, once GitHub will know your public key that was generated locally using the SSH generation uh, tool, okay, so you generated public key and private key, okay, you will have your private key locally, and you will put your public key on the GitHub server or the GitLab or I don't know, the Bitbucket server, whatever server you're using. And it will, uh, your private key will then um, be used as some sort of proof for your identity that you basically say uh, that you are who you are, okay? So this will simply allow your communication with the server. Otherwise, that just wouldn't make any sense if anybody 
could simply like access your GitHub account and to like to store things there to read or to delete. Okay, so I hope this quick but straight to the point explanation helped you out with understanding this process. And we will see in a couple of moments why this technique is more useful, let's say, in terms of encrypting your data and like making sure authenticating that it's you over somebody else who tries to like to delete something from the server or to push some unnecessary information. Okay, don't worry, we will see what happens with the message. So uh, we know now that uh, the SSH keys are similar in somewhat to using password. Okay, they are used as authentication credentials. And if we want to use SSH keys, uh, we first of all need to create them. Okay. To be honest, there are many ways and tools uh, that you can use to generate them. But I think that the most common one is the SSH key gen tool. Okay. So this command is going to generate a key pair, both public and private. Okay, write this command that you're going to use SSH key gen is going to generate a key pair, both public and private keys. This command will, um, will um, simply uh, do the following thing, it will uh, ask you, uh, the, it will tell you that it's generating a public uh, private keys. And it will ask you where it should save these keys. Usually, by default, the keys will be placed under the .ssh directory under your home directory. Okay, and the generation of the keys involves cryptographical algorithms. And one of the algorithms that may be used is the RSA algorithm. You don't have to know how this algorithm works behind the scenes because that's totally not the the point of this course. But I think that you should be at least aware of what's going on behind the scenes in the process. So <clears throat> aside to the RSA algorithm, there is also the DSA common algorithm, which is considered to be uh, considered in the past to be an old uh, US government digital signature. But based on the SSH.com website, its original form is no longer recommended. So there are also other additional algorithms that may be used. And the way to specify which algorithm you are going to use in the SSH keygen tool, okay, command is simply to use the dash T flag, okay. So using the dash T flag, you're simply going to be able to specify what exact algorithm you want to use. So uh, you will see that probably in one of our next videos, you're going to see something like this. So SSH key gen dash T and here using these dash T will specify the exact algorithm. So don't be afraid of these flags at all. All right, guys. Awesome. Also, additional thing that you should not be afraid of is the 2048 or 4096, the, uh, the number that you will see, which is basically going to represent uh, how many bits are going to be used during this algorithm. So that's also okay. No worries, guys, do not worry about different things. You may always ask me if you have any questions. So let us get back to our uh, client, I don't know, sender recipient uh, scheme. And after you created your SSH keys, okay, it's going to look something like this. Okay, so first of all, you got here like your ID RSA. And that's the private key, private key. And also you have like uh, your ID RSA dot pub which is your public key, public key. Okay, so both of them were generated during the SSH key generation process. And you want to send some message one, two, three, and you want to like so much to let's say encrypted so much that it will look something like this. Okay, so in this message, okay, there hides like this 
nice string of one, two, three, okay? Very, very kind of insane. Where is this one, two, three lies within this, I don't know, very strange long message. And that's basically something that um, if you will come to think about it, if somebody would like see this message, he would say, uh, I don't know, what is this one, two, three that I want here? And the way on uh, the process that you have to do in order to complete it, first of all, you have like to take this public key, okay, and put it or basically send it, I don't know, whatever to this guy right here, okay, this guy right here, this is the recipient, he will get like your ID RSA, rsa.pub. And why is it so great, okay? It has two main uh, important usages. First of all, only somebody with the ID RSA.pub will be able like to decrypt this uh, message that was encrypted using the private key, okay? So we will use the private key to encrypt this message, okay? We will use private key to encrypt one, two, three, then we will get like, here is the private key, right? So private key. You will take this private key, okay, and you will do some magic here and you will get this message. Then you send this message over the network and the recipient get this, gets this message. What he will do is two, thing, two things. First of all, he will try to decrypt this message using this public, public, um, public key. If he manages, he will see that the message is one, two, three, okay? So it will be used for decryption, dec decrypt, right? If I'm not mistaken, decryption uh, phase. And it will decrypt this information, decrypt, yeah, with an E, decrypt, decrypt, yeah. So, okay, never mind. Uh, so one, two, three, and it will get the message getting the data successfully okay successfully and the second thing that this guy will be able to tell is authentication so he will be able to tell exactly that the guy who sent the message okay or the data or the code that you want to put on your server is exactly the man who's uh, who says he is okay since he got this ID RSA private key and only this private key basically works with this ID RSA public key. So this will allow us basically to a more secure way to send traffic from A to B as well as authentication and not to let like anybody else, okay, that sits, I don't know, somewhere else to send data to our server and like to, to tell, listen, that's me. It's okay, accept the data. No, but the recipient will say, uh, listen, I don't know how to decrypt your data using the idrsa.pub and it seems clearly you don't have this idrsa private key, which really makes me wonder if you are who you say you are. Okay, guys? So uh, basically this is it for uh, this general explanation and that's what we are going to do in the next video. Okay, so pay attention close, pay close attention to the commands that you are going to be given and the commands that you are going to see. They are going to be used to configure correctly our SSH keys and our uh, work with GitHub or GitLab, whatever we will use. So I hope this is clear to you, very important. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. It's not so trivial, but I tried to make these things visualized and to show you them as best as I can. Thank you guys and good luck. Proceed on working hard, leave some review and uh, re leave some review on the course. And my name is Vlad, this is Alpha Tech, and I'll see you on the next videos. So at this point, we know that our remote GitHub repository is set to be public instead of private. And also we know that we configured Git to work with this specific URL, so we can always check it out by using git remote-v. And now what we are going to do is to set up a connection by generating some SSH keys that will allow basically our computer to work, to push and to fetch 
things to and from GitHub. So these steps basically can be found on the original website of GitHub. And what we are going to do is just uh, to follow some commands, some instructions that we are going to do together to set it up correctly. So let's start with it. Use SSH, SSH-key generator T, and we are going to use algorithm RSA-B4096 capital C, and here specify your email address. So that's not something that you have to remember all of these commands uh, you can see always in the video or in the official GitHub website or how you can generate an SSH key pair. So press enter and you can see that we are trying to generate a private public RSA key pair. That's basically the default, that's the name of the file, of the private file, and it's going to be located under this path. So you can hit enter and it will create you this file and also the public file, which will be id underscore rsa.pub. But in my case, I'm just going to uh, create this file with a different file name because I already have id rsa, uh, not for this, uh, let's say this GitHub account that we created just for this course. So I'm going just to specify full pass. So it's like C users vladdy.ssh and I'm going to call it, let's say, alpha tech course, alpha tech ID RSA, and I'm going to press enter. Okay, so enter passphrase, press enter, again enter, and there you go, you can navigate now to your SSH directory, so change directory home, and here specify .ssh, and you are going to be located in the SSH directory, and now we are going to see all the files here, you are going to use ls command to see all the files, and you can see here that basically two of your files are going to be like this, idrsa, which is the private part, and and the idea RSA, which is the public part. It's nothing that you have to remember how it works and how this uh, algorithm works behind the scene to create it, but simply remember this line that you create your, um, your keys, your uh, key pair, and remember where you store it. Now we are going to add this SSH private key, okay? So use SSH dash add. We are going to add this SSH private key to our SSH agent, and we are going to do it like alpha tech in my case, IDRSA. You are just going to do probably IDRSA without the alpha tech. So just press enter, and now could not open a connection to your authentication agent. So that's something that probably says that your agent is not running right now. And to start an SSH agent, you are going to use the following command, eval, and here SSH agent, 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 dash S, and there you go, agent process ID is 20, 12, 1286. Okay, so now we can go back and run our previous command and see how it works. So identity edit, alpha tech ID RSA, and your email address should be here. And last thing that we have to do to set up our connection correctly, we need to take this file, this idrsa.pub, alphatechidrsa.pub, and to copy it to GitHub. So simply use the command of clip and then use uh, alphatech.pub, okay? Press enter and now it's copied to your clipboard. And now we are going to, to GitHub to edit there. So here we are at GitHub. Let's go here to settings. And there you go to settings. It's alpha tech. And we are going to SSH and GPJ keys. Press it. Now hit the new SSH key. And in the title, specify descriptive label for, for this key. So in my case, I'm going to specify, let's say, GitHub, alpha tech course, okay? Now go to the key and press paste, and here will be all the content of your idrsa.pub. Click on add SSH key, and now GitHub asks you to confirm your password. So just insert your password, and there you go, confirm it. And there you go, you can see here under the SSH keys sections uh, that this is a list of all the SSH keys associated with your GitHub account. So one SSH key we created on our computer to 
be able to work with GitHub. So now we can go back to our Git bash and try to push our local repository to GitHub and hopefully this will work. So now we are at our git bash and let's go to our repository. So at least at me it's desktop first git project, navigate to your repository. And now what we are going to do, we are going to go with git push origin master. Okay, so previously it didn't work. But now once we configured everything, and we hope to see that it works correctly. So now let's just use git push origin master and hope that everything will work smoothly. And we could take our local repository and put it to GitHub. And it seems to be working correctly. So we managed to take our local repository and to push everything to the remote GitHub. So pretty amazing guys, let's go to GitHub and make sure that all of our repository can be seen right on this website. Okay, so now let's refresh it and make sure that it works as we expected. So there you go, you can see that this is your GitHub repository. And it's a copy. It's, it's basically a copy of all of the repository you have locally. So here is our greetings file. Here is our hello world file. And you can see also the commits history during uh, the development process that we had locally. So if we click on it, you can see all the commits that were done during our development. So your first commit using git added greetings file, some descriptive message for the commit. So you can see all the development process. But now it's not only locally, but it's on GitHub and it's remotely. And you can ask people to collaborate and to keep on developing your awesome project. So that's just amazing, guys, you have an online copy. And that's freaking awesome. So there you go, we configured our local git repository, our first git project to work with a remote GitHub repository. So this is it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. And I'll see you in the next one. Welcome back, beautiful people. So in this video, we are going to take a look at some interesting topics. Let's say we are looking at topics regarding Coronavirus. And here we have a lot of repositories, right? We explored it we in previous videos, we've seen how we can work with it. So let's say we want to take a look at this repository regarding reverse engineering. So just press it. And here we are, we are at this repository called Corona. So let's take a look at what are these buttons watch and star basically, let's try to understand what they are doing. So basically, this button is related to the situation where you find some GitHub repository that you like, for example, this one. And you may hit this watch button. And what it basically means is that as long as you're watching this repository, you will be notified whenever a change is made to this project. So if you want to be updated with a specific project with a specific repository, or maybe it's many repositories that you find out. Uh, that's how you do it, you just press the watch. And then you specify when you want to be notified. So be notified of all conversation, uh, releases only and basically just just choose whatever you like. So we are going to go with this one. And basically every uh, everything new that is going to be in this project, we are going to be notified. And of course, if you want to stop your notifications or to modify just go and unwatch it. So also we have star and this star is a little bit similar to watch. And a lot of people actually confuse this one with with watch. And all star basically does is bookmark is kind of bookmark a given repository, you will not get notified like watching a repository. But rather, if you go to your GitHub profile, you will see all the bookmark project that you've stared. So let's press it. Okay, we are starting staring at this uh, repository. So now we are going to go to our GitHub profile. And there you go. Let's go to our profile. And you can see here that you have one project that you are staring. Okay, so here it is. Here is the Corona. So 
simply specify a bookmark, bookmarks of all the projects that you are interested in, in kind of following them. And the watching just keeps you updated with uh, notifications when the project is, um, is updated. So just to summarize, if you have some projects that you like and you want to kind of bookmark or save them without being notified on every change in them, that's how you do it. So I hope that's clear. And in the next video, we are going to take a look at a couple of additional buttons. Let's say if we go here uh, once again to the project, we are going to take a look at a couple of uh, additional buttons. Uh, for example, if we want to take a look at this corona.py file and we want to know what are these buttons, raw, blame, and let's take a look at history. All right, so now let's talk about the raw button. And basically, if you ever want to copy, let's say just one particular file from GitHub, for example, corona.py that we found in this repository, if you want to copy uh, all of the file or maybe just part of the file to test it out how it works and so on, then instead of just copying it as is, click the raw button and it will give you all the raw text of this source file. And the reason why I mention it here is because people, yes, including me at the beginning, are copying this text file as we've seen previously, this text file, and basically there are a lot of problems when they pasting it to their IDE. And the reason for that is very simple because on this page, on this GitHub page, this text that you can see here is formatted. You can see there are these little nice colors and also other HTML things are going behind the scenes. So simply saying when you will paste this copied text into your IDE, you may also get a lot of unexpected characters that you would not know where they even came from. So just to summarize, whenever you want to copy a file or just some part of the file, use the raw button, open the raw source code and copy from here whatever you want to test or to check it out. And now let's see what was the second button, this blame button. So let's just click it and see what it gives us. And there you go, you can see uh, here on the left, you can see who actually wrote each one of these lines of our, uh, of our file. So that's our file, that's the whole corona.py file. And you can see who did, who specified, who wrote every line in this file. And we know that since we are working on GitHub, each of these files may be edited and modified by a lot of users and com contributors. So it's very important to keep track of who added every line of the code. And also it's very useful if, for example, you have some major bug. So in this case, by using this blame, you can actually find out what piece of code uh, caused this problem. For example, let's say that this is the problem in your code. So in this case, you will be able to find out who did this bug and pretty, pretty um, blame him, blame him, but don't blame your uh, developers or someone who contributed to your file. I, I assume that was not done on purpose, but it will give you a lot of control over your project and to understand who does exactly what in every file and in every directory. So that's pretty awesome and that's something that you have to know. And now let's check out our third button for this video and this button is called history. And by clicking this button, this will pretty much show you all the commits of this particular file, of this corona.py file. So it basically stands for the history of commits for a given file. And please guys, just don't confuse the history of commits for this, for this particular file uh, with the project commits that also contain other commits, right? So if we go back and we go here to our project, so press it and you can see right here, you can see that you also have all of your commits, 68 commits, which include not only the corona.py file, but files, but 
also uh, in other files. So you have all the commits for a particular file as well as you also have uh, the commits for all of your project. So I hope it's clear to you guys. It's very important to know some at least of the basic functionality, the basic buttons on GitHub uh, that will help you to become better developer. And as always, thank you so much for watching. I wish you a great day and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye, guys. Welcome back guys. So in this video, we are going to talk about issues and what it means. Let's first of all, open up our GitHub project, our first Git project. And here you can see uh, this little nice section called issues. So basically the issues section in GitHub is kind of a to-do list for a given project for this given repository. And although the word issues may sound just like something negative, like just for bugs or something like that, actually it may be used for other things such as enhancement, questions and so on. We'll, we will see it uh, right away. So we can say that issues is considered to be the GitHub's tracker. So you better be familiar with uh, this term, this section, especially if you are planning to find a job or work with the team on some project. All right, so how do these issues work? Every issue you create on GitHub will have some associated, inform associated information. So let's try and create, currently we have no issues, but let's try to create a new issue. Press on this button, new issue, and now, first of all, you have to specify the title. Each issue should have a description, a file, and maybe a comment, some description explaining what this issue is all about. Then every issue can be labeled with the associated well label. Now these labels are nothing but awesome because they allow you some nice way to organize different types of issues. So let's take a look at a quick example. Let's say we have an issue which is a bug and you basically will label it as a bug and it will be given with this red color to catch the eye because it's probably urgent and some files should be fixed as soon as possible. And this may also help us filter issues based on some category, maybe a, duplica a duplication, documentation, enhancement, or some question. It may help us to, uh, to organize and to filter out issues based on their label. So also what we have here is label. Also we have this milestone and it's just sort of a container for issues. It will just provide you with the ability to associate issues uh, with different project phases or different features that you are working on. Also, you can assign someone who will be responsible for working on this particular issue. Pretty awesome. Just like a real to-do list with people being assigned to different tasks. In the body of the issue, you can describe, we said it previously, you can describe what the issue is all about, the title, uh, we already said it, and, and if the label is, let's say, an enhancement issue, then specify what exactly you want to do, when, how, and so on. You got the idea. Work uh, and describe everything appropriately with a good description. You may also put here some references to other relevant issues. So this way the problem will become more clear. You also may, um, you may mention other people uh, during some bigger, let's say, issue and decide to assigning someone that will be in charge of this issue. People that are part of this repository may actually participate help and share their knowledge uh, on this given issue by using comments. So that's also another great feature of using GitHub issues. And I guess you can see how amazing all of this development process becomes, right guys? We are actually managing our own project, which is awesome. This may take you so many steps ahead of people who are not familiar with these tools yet. And I hope you already see why it's so important knowing this much uh, when coming, for example, to a job interview. Because, I mean, probably the company you will be trying to be hired is using GitHub or some other similar tool. So bear it in mind and 
This is it for this video. Thank you so much and I'll see you in the next one. All right, guys, so in this video, we are going to talk about what is Git Ignore. So suppose you're working on some big project and there are plenty of different files with these strange extensions that may be generated automatically by different stages of your development process. For example, files generated during the compilation steps, uh, for example, the build files, uh, maybe some temporary files that were created by your ID, let's say, I don't know, some text files, some temp text files, and basically you got the idea. And some of these files may be just not useful to other collaborators. They are simply not pure source code and that's basically why we may not want them to be part of our final repository where we add and commit our changes. So for that we have git ignore that comes to our help. Think of it as a special file, kind of a text file that all it does is to tell Git about some specific files that it should not keep track of. Once again, it's just a special file, we will create it right away, that you can use and configure whenever you don't want Git to keep track of something. For example, uh, you want Git to stop tracking the build directory and to stop uh, tracking some temporary files and so on. So once we create this git ignore file uh, and once it's configured, the ignored files and directories will not be part of our next commits. So let's see how it can be created. For that, we are going to use our git bash. So touch dot git ignore git ignore and just remember not to forget this dot at the beginning of the file name and now once the file was created um let's see basically how we can configure it so let's open it up with our notepad plus plus for example so there you go that's our file right let's just edit it uh so here you go edit with notepad plus plus and oops it's open up here um, so you can see the file name is .gitignore and now let's talk about how we can configure it uh, to tell git what exactly it should not keep track of. So basically in this file each line will represent something that we want git to ignore. And let's say that during our development process we've developed some cool application and we've generated some build directory as we've just seen. And it's something that shouldn't be part of our repository because everyone should build it on his own platform based on his own specifications. It's not directly related to our source code which we developed, right? So we can add the following line, build slash and save it. And this line will basically tell Git to ignore everything in this build subdirectory. And if, for example, you wanted to stop keeping track of, let's say, all the TXT files in your project, just an example, all right? Then for that, you can use a wildcard match and do something like this, star TXT, star dot TXT. And this will ignore all files with the TXT extension. Very easy. Just basically what we are doing here is just using some rules to specify what type of files and directories you want Git to stop keeping track of. So from this point on, when we will commit our changes, everything under the build directory and all the .txt files won't be part of it. You can actually give it a try on your own and play with it a little bit to get some you know, some feeling of how it works and what files and subdirectories you may want to ignore for your own projects. So awesome guys, great job, you're doing great. We've managed to cover up so much so quickly. I hope you're keeping up with the pace. Let me know that your feedback is much appreciated. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. We will gladly help you with whatever we can. So now we're almost done. Just two last important things that I wanted to cover in this video. And the first one is that we know that there may be some people who will be working on one and the same project, right? So in this case, we should also inform them 
and let them know about the rules we are using in the gitignore file. Makes sense, right? So we want to kind of include our gitignore file as part of our repository. And for that, we are going to commit it. So let's go with git status and we can see that we have here gitignore. So let's add it. So add git gitignore. Uh, and now we are going to do a commit. So git commit dash M specify an associated message. Let's say something like added dot git ignore file with ignore ignore rules. All right. And now hit enter and let's also push it to our GitHub remote repository. So git push origin master because we are already know how to, we can do it uh, and now it's a part of our repository of our local repository and also in our remote repository so now people who are working uh, on our project will be able to see what files are being typically ignored uh, during the development process. Awesome. So lastly, a great tip that I have for you guys is that GitHub maintains an official list of recommended gitignore files that you may choose based on your operating system, the environment you're using, and even different programming languages. So whether you're developing something using Python, Java, Kotlin, Rust, C++, or even people who work with WordPress, <laughs> you should definitely check out the gitignore templates that you have on GitHub and consider using them for your own project. So with that being said, have a great day, guys. Keep on learning, keep on improving yourself, and you are bound to succeed. I'll see you in the next video. Now let's discuss what is fork on GitHub. Let's say that you've been exploring GitHub, checking out different projects. And for example, as we said in one of our previous videos, you checked out uh, projects that are related to Corona. And for example, you happen to find some interesting project that maybe you would like to work on to fix some bugs to improve or even to suggest a couple of your own ideas. So in this case, what you probably would like to do is to copy this project, you would like to have your own copy of this project on your GitHub account. So if you do it this way, you will be able to freely work uh, on this project to suggest your changes without making any optional damage to this nice real author. And for that, that's exactly why we have fork. So fork simply makes your own copy of this given repository. And once basically let's click it and once it will be complete, uh, you can go on and back to your GitHub profile. And we will see that this repository was copied to our GitHub account. You can see here alpha teacher and Corona. And you can see that it was forked from Geohot was a girl hot something like this corona so basically you can see that all of this repository is now on your github account which is pretty amazing and now let's say that we think we have some formula that can help with fighting the coronavirus and we are going to go here add file and create new file with some feature that will be capable of let's say solving solving the puzzle or at least suggesting some some ideas for improvement. So let's call this file feature feature for Corona solver, let's say feature Corona solver dot py. And this file will basically have I have some formula, some formula that can help you that can help you to to let's say reverse engineering uh, the virus. Hopefully this was so easy, right guys? So there you go, you have this file with all of the necessary code that you suggest and you think may help uh, the real author uh, on his own project where you forked it from. So now you're going to add uh, this file and commit this new file. Let's say some commit, um, added, and let's say added a new feature for fighting for let's say reverse engineering, reverse engineering 
And there you go. You can add also uh, some other uh, additional uh, explanation. And we are going to commit this file. And the changes were committed in our own repository, right? It has nothing to do with, with the original repository, but rather we are working just on our own repository on the GitHub website. And now basically once you're done with all of your changes, maybe you added one file, two files, I don't know, one feature, two feature, you may want to kind of share your addition and your uh, new changes with the actual creator to suggest your changes that you've just done. And the way to do it will be simply by hitting this pull request button. So once you hit it, the real author of the real repository that you forked will be able to review the changes and decide if these changes that you are proposing right now, if they should be merged with his real project. So that's basically a great way to contribute on GitHub and to work with different people on different projects. And once again, guys, whenever you're going to hit now this create pull request button, what you're basically doing is you're kind of knocking on the repository's owner door and tells him that you've done some changes to the project and that now you want, you want him to review it and merge it uh, with, the, with his own project. And of course, I'm not going to make this pull right now because <laughs> I really got nothing to suggest and I will just waste his time. But I hope that's clear uh, as to how you can use Fork on GitHub. And to summarize in just one, two sentences, how you can work with other people projects. Basically, you make your own copy uh, of the repository that you want to work on by using the Fork. And then you make some changes, do a pull request, and that's it. From this point, the real author has to decide what to do with it next. So awesome, guys. I hope everything is clear so far. That's an amazing thing uh, that you've learned in this video and you're probably going to use that a lot in your career. So thank you so much for watching. Leave me some feedback in the comments to let me know if you like the explanation and I will see you soon. Bye. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another video in our amazing Git and GitHub crash course. And in this video, we are going to talk about clone. So we have here on the right our GitHub account, and we can see that we have two repositories. The first one is first Git project that we've created in our previous sections. And also we have some project called Corona that we forked from uh, some another repository on GitHub. So we already know how the fork functionality works on GitHub and that it simply takes some GitHub repository that you choose and it simply copies it to your GitHub account. So this way you can suggest some changes, modify some files and basically make a pull request to the real developer of this project and basically hope that he will merge it and find this information useful for further development. But forking is nice, but sometimes it may be simply not enough. For example, if you want to take some project and to make some active development, to use some IDE, to make some tests, to try running it on different platforms, to check performance and so on, this won't, won't simply be enough and it will simply not be possible if you're just going to use the fork functionality because the forked repository is mostly static in its nature. It exists on GitHub server, but we don't have it locally, right? We don't have it here so that we can work uh, on it as we should. You cannot connect to it anything, right? If it's here, if it's on the GitHub account, you can't connect any IDE and start working on it and making some tests and to compile it and so on. You may just do static editing like we've done previously and to create some file, add some text and that's it. So this is the reason why exactly we should be considering to use clone. That's not clown, don't misspell it, but rather clone. We are going to make a clone of this repository we just forked, you're with me, right? We forked some repository and we have a copy of it on our GitHub account that's just somewhere in the cloud. And now we are going to take this repository from our GitHub account and to clone it directly to our local computer. 
so that now we can actively develop it, test it out on our platform, make all the necessary changes by using our favorite IDE. Basically, we we are working locally, it's just like, like our home. So I hope you can see the difference between forking and cloning, at least to some extent, based on what we've specified. So let's simply clone it, okay? So I'm just going to uh, our repository here, Alpha Tech, Alpha Teacher Corona. And here you are, you can see, um, let me take a minute, oh, la 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 la, where it is? Where it is? Here it is. Let's just copy it, okay? So just copy. Go to your git bash, change directory to, let's say, desktop. And here we are going to use the following command. So git clone and specify exactly what you've copied, paste, and hopefully this will clone your repository here on your GitHub account to the desktop. And now if you're going to do change directory to Corona, so here you're going to be uh, working on this nice uh, repository, but now it's all going to be done locally. So maybe you want to make some changes. Let's see what files do we have here. Here is our feature Corona uh, solver. Let's say we, on, we want to edit it a little bit and to uh, add something to this file. So let's open up Notepad. So here you can see all of the directory related to the project. And here we have the feature Corona solver. Uh, let's just open it up with Notepad, edit it. Let's say, all right, here we added the best idea uh, that we thought of, that we thought of, thought of locally, right? So that's we'll simply specify that we worked locally and this edition was done from our local computer. Let's save it, close it. And now what we are going to do, we are going to add and commit these changes and then we are going to see what exactly we are going to do. So let's go back to git bash. So here we are at our git bash and now we can uh, say git status to see the status to make sure that the file was changed. And you see that the file was really modified. So we are going to add it. So git add feature, feature, all right. And now we are going to commit the changes. Um, added new functionality. Uh, from local, la la la. And there you go. Now we are going to commit. We committed successfully, but this commit can only be seen on our local computer, right? It's on our local repository. So the next step that we are going to do is that we are going to take this repository, this local repository with our new commit and new changes and push it back to the fork repository we have on our GitHub account. So for that, we are going to use one of the commands we learned previously, and this command is called git git push origin master. Is that okay or no? Let's see. So now we are trying to push everything out to our GitHub account, and we are going back here. Let's try to refresh it and see what happens. So there you go. You can see the last commit was done less than a minute ago. And if we are going to open up this file, you can see that it was lastly modified just a minute ago. We are, we can see also the commit itself, the message, added new functionality from local, which is exactly what we've specified in our git bash. So let's open up the file to make sure that it exactly what happened. And there you go. You can see that this is the modification that you've made from your local computer. Now what we are going to do is that we are going to go back to our project uh, on GitHub here. So let's just resize it a little bit so that we can see it to the fullest. And now that you know that you've done all of the changes, all of the active development on your local computer, you pushed it back to your GitHub account. Now it's still not on the main repository of the original author of the original developer. So the steps that we are going to do now is to make a pull request and to suggest our changes just like we've done previously when we were working with uh, the first previous fork uh, video. So here you can see the changes that were done and you are going to propose him uh, your changes and to discuss and review the changes uh, with uh, the author of the real repository that you forked from. So 
when you will cre uh, create a pull request, that's actually what you are going to do to discuss and review the changes. And basically, that's how you work with clone. That's how you work with fork. That's what a pull request is all about. So nothing complicated, but it's just important to understand uh, the core concept of this flow. So awesome. Thank you guys so much for watching. I think we're doing great. This course was really, we took a lot of topics and just squished it to, to one, one simple crash course that I really hope you like. Thank you so much. All right, guys, welcome back. And since a lot of you asked for this video, I decided that I should definitely not let you down. And I've added the branches concept to our Git and GitHub crash course. So let's talk about what are branches, why you should consider using them. And also let's see exactly how we can use them as part of our version control system. So in one of our previous videos, we cloned some repository from GitHub and started working on it locally, right? We wanted to suggest some additions or some features or whatever it was. And all of the changes we've done, all the commits, everything was done on the master branch, right? This was the only branch we've been working with so far. And simply saying, that's not how it should be done. I mean, think of the following situation where we've made some changes by adding this new feature of ours, this new cool feature, this uh, new cool feature that we uh, have been working on for a while. And we've done all of that uh, on the master branch. And by doing so, maybe, maybe it can happen, right? That we've missed something out and these changes actually affected the whole program and now it may even corrupt your entire project. I mean, that's something that may totally happen, right? To every one of us. So in such a case, we will need to revert the changes and dig into all of them, trying to figure out where, where everything uh, just went wrong and find this previous good version that everything was working correctly. And basically this situation, uh, it could be really frustrating, trust me. I'm telling you this from my painful personal experience. So for you guys to avoid this problem and a couple of other problems, we are going to use additional branches as part of our development process. And we are going to learn how we can do it right. So I hope you're ready, grab yourself something nice to drink and here we go. So basically, what are these branches? My suggestion to you guys is to think of branches as just another version of your code, just another versions of your code, where you can actually treat these versions as some new lines of development, okay? And every, every new line of development, this new development concept will allow us to freely make experiments, play with our code as we like, commit new changes, fix some bugs, and so on. And all of that can be done while we are in kind of our safe zone, and we know that these changes that we are doing, however we are doing them, they won't really affect our main or master branch where we have all the official things happening, right? And that's pretty amazing, guys, because it means that at any point in time, if for some reason we want to stop these testings and all of these experiments that we are doing, and we just want to go back to one of our previous versions that was working correctly on the master branch, we can do that in an instant without worrying about uh, if it will affect the changes we've done or it will not affect the changes we've done. Basically, it will be on a totally different branch, all of these changes that we've done. So that's freaking awesome. And what it basically gives us is the ability to work, for example, uh, on new features on a totally different branch without worrying if something will mess up. So uh, think about it if you have a team, okay, and you're working on some really cool project and your, um, let's say, development and your release product let's call it this way, is on master branch and you have Mike and you have team and you have all of your team working on it. So 
it doesn't make sense that everybody will make their changes and push it directly and uh, to the master branch because everybody does mistakes, right? And for example, we want to give Mike to work on some new feature on another branch and give, give this branch a name, an associated name. And let's say Stella is working on another feature and Daniel is working on fixing bugs and testing out the code. So everything should be done on separate branches. And then we will only merge, merge all of these changes with the master branch, for example, uh, only after it has been reviewed by, let's say, someone from your team and he or she has confirmed that it probably won't destroy your project. And only then you can merge the changes with the master branch and then to be ready to proceed with your project. So I hope this idea is clear to you guys as to why we're using this. So that was just one simple out of many examples regarding why branches may be used during your development process. And now let's see how it can be really done in practice. So for that, let's go back to our lovely project that we started in one of our previous sections and work with it a little bit. So let's go here and get bash here. Okay, let's go here, get bash. Okay, so let's do something like this, git status. Okay, so git status. And we saw here, we can see here on branch master, right? You can see that git status, if you write down the git status, you can see that you are uh, right now on branch master. And also here, if we will open up GitHub, okay, here is our project. Let's see, what was it, alpha teacher, right? Alpha teacher first, git project. And you can see here also the branches that your repository has on GitHub. So for example, you can see here that we have only master and also there are no additional branches yet. So we always can add additional branch and we are going to see how it can be done in our Git, uh, in our local Git, and also it can be done uh, on GitHub, but that's not what we are going to do right now. So um, let's just go here and we can see that there are a lot of changes right now. So here we have also, let's do something like git diff and see all the differences between uh, our previous version. So we have print line, no, 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 okay. So, just for the sake of this video, let's do git add and just add all of them. Git commit, la la la, before, let's say before, before talking about branches, okay, branches. So this is the commit before talking about branches. Oh, why didn't you like? Oh, 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 oh. Where is my mistake? Git commit, la 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 la, error, pathetic. Pathetic, no. <laughs> did not match uh, any file. Okay, so my bad, my bad guys, before talking about branches. Okay, before talking about branches. What's going on? Did not match any file. Known to git, git status, sorry about that. Git status, ready to be committed, git commit, the git commit dash m and Oh, I forgot the dash M. Sorry about it, guys. Heavy morning was today. So before talking about branches, and there you go, it should work right now. So git status, once again, we committed everything, nothing to commit, working tree clean. And we can also see the remote um, by using git remote, or we basically can push it to our remote GitHub repository. Okay, so git push origin master, and there you go. Let's see, la la la, let's wait for it to finish up and everything is okay. And now what we are going to do is to create an additional branch, an additional line of development and add some new functionality and features to our program. And once we will make sure that all the additions and features are working correctly and everything is ready to go, we will take all of this development and merge these changes back to the master branch and proceed with whatever we want to release or deploy. So just kind of remember that master branch is usually used for our production code, okay, as our production code, 
while all of our team should be working on different branches, suggesting new features and new things that then in the future can be merged after some review back into production. So that's how it should be done. So I hope you start feeling at least a little bit the reason behind using branches a little bit more. And now we are going to create another branch and call it, let's say, how should we call it? Let's call it descriptive greetings. Okay, so git branch, that's how you create a new branch. Descriptive greetings. Okay, so that's this descriptive greetings is the name of our new branch that we create using git branch and the name of the new branch. Hit the enter button and Basically, you can see that it seems that nothing happened, but this command actually created a new branch by first, by first of all, copying everything from our current branch. Okay, and our current branch, we could see that it was, um, that it was um, master branch. Okay, this is the current branch, and we are creating from this branch, from master branch, we are creating a new branch that is called descriptive greetings, and. What it does at this stage, it copies everything from the current branch to this new branch. And now this new line of development is ready to be used. It exists. We kind of have a copy of the master branch, okay? So uh, what we are going now to do is, first of all, I just want you to see that we are still, at this point, we are still at on, on master branch, okay? You can see here, if you do git status, you can see on master branch. And uh, if we want to switch from the current branch to another branch, for example, descriptive branch, we can we should use a particular command for that. But before that, uh, what I want to show you guys is this command git branch. And this command shows you, okay, all the branches that you have on your repository. And in this case, we have descriptive greetings branch and we have master and master is in green here because this uh, this represents where exactly what what is the current branch that we are using and if we want to check out okay to move to another branch so we use git check out and the name of the new branch so descriptive what was it descriptive greetings so it will take us to another branch where we are going to develop our new things, okay? So now if you do git branch, you will see that descriptive greetings is your branch, is your current branch, and also you have the master branch. So awesome. And now, now you can do anything that you want on this branch, whether it's to develop new features, uh, experiment with new ideas, or even trying to fix bugs. Whatever you do from this point on, okay, and it's very important to understand, uh, it will be done on the new branch and not on the master. It won't, or at least it shouldn't, affect the master branch in any way. Is that clear so far? I hope. I hope it does. So let me know if you have any questions so far. Feel free to ask and I will gladly try to explain it to you even better if something is not uh, right. So let's see an example and add some new features to our greetings.py file. Okay, so just to make sure you get status, you can see that on branch descriptive greetings, nothing to commit, working diarrhea, uh, working tree clean. So let's say we want to add some motivation phrase for this file for greetings.py. Okay, we can see here all the files in our directory. So uh, let's add a new phrase called if you can dream it, you can do it. So I'm going to use the VI, VI greetings. You can use Notepad exactly as we've done so far. I'm just going to use it this way. Okay, so you can see here all of the code. Of course, once again, you can use Notepad to make your changes. And I'm going to add some motivation phrase that is called, if you can do it, if you, no, if you can dream it, you can do it. Very good. That's a simple change, right? So. Basically, we just added the, this new line. Think of it as a new feature, a new motivation feature that makes your program motivated. And then you're going to save it. So save it if you're using Notepad. I'm going to save it like this. So 
we saved it, we can exit it. So now if we do get status, we expect to see that some changes were made to the greetings.py file and that's a simple change, right? So we just go edit and then commit it. So git add, git add greetings.py and then we can go and make our commit. So git commit dash m and let's say added motivation motivation phrase okay okay so very good and also we want let's say we want to add some new additional feature let's say some new file that knows how to fly to the moon okay so what we are going simply to do is to create a new file okay we can see here the list of the files we have we are going to create a new file let's call it uh, moon flight okay moonflight.py once again i'm doing this from the terminal because it's easier for me to work uh, work on it right now instead of opening notepad if you're using notepad simply go to the directory that you're working on to your repository like this one desktop first git project and make new file call this file moonflight.py if you want to practice with me along the course and uh, we are going to, let's say, what this file notes, knows to do. Let's say it goes like this. I am a program that knows, okay, that knows how to fly, how to fly to the moon. Very good. Okay, so that's a program. I'm a program that knows how to fly to the moon. Of course, we are not implementing it because we don't even know how, how it can be done. But... Think of it as a new feature that one of your colleagues or you or even you develop uh, on your project. So let's close it. And now uh, we're going to do git status. We can see that Moonflight was um, was created, modified, and even untracked. So git add Moonflight git commit dash m added Moonflight file and functionality functionality okay so nothing complicated so far we have added our two um, features additions whatever you you can call it and now what we are going to do is to okay so bear in mind okay we have just just for you to remember this file this moon flight feature and also the additions we've done to the greetings file they were added on the master uh, on the greetings what was it on the uh, descriptive greetings branch okay so what i want to show you guys is even how it looks on github okay it didn't affect master branch at all but i want you to see it clearly so let's just go git push origin master and what we are going to do is to take all of the changes we've done on the new branch that we've created and push it back to our GitHub repository. So git push origin master and let's see what happens. Everything is up to date, okay? Why is that? It's because on the master branch, if we push it, it's during the fact that we already pushed everything from this branch. And what we want to do is to push descriptive greetings, okay? To push everything related to this branch. So there you go, git push origin descriptive greetings. And now it should push everything from, okay, from your um, local new branch to GitHub. So let's see how it looks like. So, okay, so there you go. You have uh, descriptive greetings had new, had recent pushes less than a minute ago, okay. And what you're going to do to see right now, let's refresh it to make sure that nothing is missed out. Okay, so... You have here, previously, you had only the master branch, and now you have two branches, the master and the descriptive greetings. This is our previous, um, this is our previous uh, push and our previous commit to the master branch, okay? And you can see all the files in the master repository, okay? In the master repository, in the master branch, sorry for that, in the master branch. And uh, you can see that the moon flight for example the moon flight file is not here okay and why is that 
The moonflight file is not here and also if we open up the greetings.py we can see that there is no message um, that we added like if you can dream it, you can do it. There is nothing like that. So why is that guys? It's because we said previously that whenever we create a new branch and we work on, new, on our new branch, the previous branch, for example, in this case master, won't be affected. It will not be affected at all because we are working on a new line of development. And if, for example, at any point in time, for example, right now, okay, when you are here, you added all the changes and something is messed up and nothing is working and you want to go back to your master branch, you can do it with, with just checking out git, use git, check out, and just check out to your master branch, okay? So whenever you will do this, you will simply go back to your project where we didn't have, where we didn't have anything related to the moon and to the new edition uh, of if you can dream it, you can do it. So I hope that's clear. It's super important for you to understand this concept. And also what I want to show you guys is that if you go here, okay, on GitHub, you can go also to descriptive greetings branch, okay? So you simply change the branch and you can see here that all the additions, okay, that you've done to this branch and it's not related to the main branch, to the master branch. So here you see the moonflight file that was added. It's not on the master, but it's on this branch. And also if you go to greetings.py file, you will see that this phrase, if you can dream it, you can do it, also has been added. So it has been added on your new line of development. And if you will make sure or let somebody else to check it out and he made sure that these changes you've done, Moonflight and uh, the if you can dream it, you can do it, are correct and are good and are you've done some tests, you can make compare and pull request and you can merge then uh, everything right to the master branch and proceed with developing your product and your code. So guys, I hope everything is clear to you right now and branching is a very important concept and it's considered to be actually the core concept of Git and GitHub because even the basics and especially the advanced topics and workflow are based upon branches. And another note is, last note for this video is that you have to remember that whenever you're working or you will work on some project, even if it's already installed and running somewhere, if you want to make some changes to it, for example, like we've been working on some project that we forked and cloned from some somewhere else, uh, and you want to make some changes to it to check new features, work on new on, on bugs and so on, just remember this much. You should use other branches and then simply leave the master branch just for the deployment, okay? so. This is it pretty much for these branches concept. I hope uh, everything that is, uh, everybody that, who is enrolled to my course find this information useful. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching. Please let me know if you liked this video, if you liked this course by leaving a review and leaving a star rating. And this helps me a lot in improving myself in, and improving the materials in this course. So thank you so much guys and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye, have a great day.